Describing his writing process, George R. R. Martin describes himself as a gardener as opposed to an architect. He plants seeds and watches them grow as he waters them with his thoughts and ideas. But they often don't grow the way he expects. I mean, nature, being as it is, uh, is unpredictable. He surprises even himself where these ideas go. And that's what you can do when you're extremely skilled and talented or both. You just rely on your own internal well of ideas and expect it to keep producing. And it has. On the other hand, architects make plans, which means lots of notes, documents, blueprints, that sort of thing. You've heard of it. I mean, you may not be an architect yourself, but you get the idea. Same as gardening. They're very different, but they do both produce amazing results. In George's writing, as in his world, there are exceptions. Most of his characters are morally gray, but Gregor Clegane is an argument for an example who is not. Most He likes to break and invert tropes, but sometimes he runs with established ones. Expecting him to break a trope means you can be caught off guard when he doesn't. So, you know, he's got to keep us on our toes. And today's episode is no exception to that exception. Today we have a rare glimpse into his process, into his garden, so to speak. And it is one of those exceptions. He says he doesn't do much outlining, a whole lot of planning, but he does some. Because that's what we have for you today. An analysis of actual handwritten notes of George's plans for A Feast for Crows. And because he's a gardener, it's not really just A Feast for Crows. The outline was for A Feast for Crows, but actually a lot of these notes wound up being plans for A Dance with Dragons and The Winds of Winter instead. And maybe even beyond that, because we obviously don't know exactly what's in The Winds of Winter at this point. So while this is an outline for one book, it ends up being an outline for the final, these last three books, or the final two books with one that's not out yet. <laughs> for example, there's notes about Danny and John and Tyrion, who of course aren't in A Feast for Crows, so that's a big clue right there. So if you think this is a rarity, you're right. Not only are his notes rare, but access to them is even rarer. The only other outline seen in the fandom is the 1993 outline that we've referred to several times throughout the history of the history of Westeros podcast. That one is extremely fun to analyze and ponder, but this outline is a recent gift to the fandom, and unlike the 1993 outline, which mostly focused on early plot lines, this one has notes on things yet to come, things that haven't happened yet. So we have all that and more on this episode of History of Westeros podcast. Hello and welcome everybody. Welcome back to another episode. It's our final live stream of the year 2023. You may not be listening to this in 2023, but that is when it was recorded the day before Christmas. Technically Christmas Eve we are recording this, and that's appropriate because we look at this outline as something of a gift. It's a rare thing, not something we would have expected, kind of came out of nowhere, and it's got some great notes in it. If it was just a bunch of things that we kind of knew about or expected or it happened already, it probably wouldn't be worth going over, but there's some juicy stuff in here, y'all. When we do live streams there at 3 p.m. almost every Sunday on YouTube, you can catch it afterwards, still on YouTube, or edited on Spotify. The audio versions are available everywhere, and they're, you find podcasts, that is, and they're ad-free on Patreon. Shout out to our good friend Nina, who added some excellent notes for this one, really helping think through the processes here. We really got to put a lot of deep thinking into George's process here, and Nina was had some great insights on that. Latest blog post on her site, goodqueenalley.tumblr.com, that's with one L in Alley, is about Silva Santigar and her marriage to Lord Estermont and what will happen upon his death to her and to House Estermont in general, and a couple other tidbits. So check that out, goodqueenalley.tumblr.com. If you have any questions, live or otherwise, send them to westroshistory at gmail.com, and we'll mention some episodes throughout this one that relate to the topics here uh, for further immersion. If you want to stay in Westeros after this episode, we've got you covered with more episodes directly. Trivia question. Let's start with that. As we so often do, the answer will be at the end. Who does his gray grace refer to? The phrase gets used, and we will have it in this episode. So the answer, if you don't know it already, you can find it by listening. It has nothing to do with the green grace or the blue grace or the red graces, by the way. But 
mm, good thinking if that occurred to you because it's close. All right, let's get a little setup before we dive into the actual outline, like where this came from and who brought it to us and all that other stuff. Shout out to Zionius. Zionius is the keeper of the Sospake Martin archives. And if Zionius uh, says it's high quality, says it's got uh, the providence it claims to have, meaning it came from George, that it's real, then we trust it. And there's other people, it's been verified elsewhere. It came to Reddit through uh, Arnold Cha and Zionius. Arnold is the, runs the George R. R. Martin Rarities Facebook group. And also shout out to G. Steph, who is the, has earned the title Keeper of the Cushing Library Secrets. The Cushing Library in Texas is where a lot of George's archives are kept. They aren't, you're not allowed to copy them or do anything like that, but you can visit them. Uh, you can go to the library and look at them directly. And G. Steph has spent a lot of time doing that. So big thanks for that. Because some of the stuff in there, it, we've cross-referenced to that. You'll see as we go along what that means. Also, thanks to everyone who actually transcribed the notes. They're, as we said, handwritten, and they were meant for George himself, so they're kind of sloppy. <laughs> you know, if you ever write notes to yourself like a grocery list or something like that, it kind of looks like that. So there was some effort put into getting this right, and we definitely appreciate that because we personally didn't have anything to do with the transcription, only the analysis that came after. The people that did that are Jones Tony 710 Glass Table Girl, that's Eliana of Girls Gone Canon. Fat Walda, Mismatched Eyes, that's our very own mod, History of Westeros mod, Laura Brandos. Uh, Jay Fong 86, Mighty Isabel, and I Delenhaw. Thanks, y'all. That was really great work. And I hope uh, this is worthy of the, uh, the effort. We have three pages, but two different writings. In other words, George wrote two pages... And then at some other point, he wrote another page, and these were all put together. Uh, so you can tell they're different because there's a different style, there's a different, it's different paper, and yeah, the notes are just a little different. So some, there's, some of them are repeated, like there's Tyrion notes on both, there's John notes on both, but not necessarily all the characters. Each page has POV characters and phrases. Many of them are just one-liner pieces of dialogue, something that, like a mnemonic device for George, like a, a key moment that he is referred to uh, himself by one or two lines that he's going to remember. Or maybe it's an idea that he wanted to develop. Uh, something that he's aiming for, something that he's trying to find a way to. Like he wants to get a character to this point, but he has to fill in the, everything in between that. Or several characters in some cases. So there's a caveat here, of course, that this is... A small portion of his thoughts. There's some very juicy stuff in here, like I said, but we can't go too far with all of it. We can't make assumptions about what some of these notes mean. We can offer ideas, but in some cases we won't be sure. And just because a plot point or character isn't mentioned doesn't mean that he's not committed to them. It just might mean he has notes on them elsewhere. Or he had already figured it out or he hadn't figured it out yet. And thus the notes are sparse or not there at all. You'll see some good examples of that. And you, some of you might be wondering why we aren't putting this on screen if you're watching on video. Hmm? Well, some of it's on screen. I mean the actual handwritten notes, which we didn't put on screen. You did. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. <laughs> right on. Very good. Okay. Well, <clears throat> so one of the challenges, is, challenges for us here is trying to take note of what isn't here. But we're used to that. George's intentional omissions are often very telling. One of my favorites, for example, is the fact that the Iron Bank is never mentioned even once in any of Arya's Bravos chapters. <laughs> very telling, right? <laughs> I don't know exactly what's telling about that, but it's telling. So this episode is giving me a chance as well to bust out some stats on the books. I took a lot of stats during Valar Reredus for A Song of Ice and Fire. And by that, I mean how many chapters each character had or how long their chapters were, or how big a percent of the book they took up. And it's because George had notes on how many chapters he expected some of these things to take. So it's kind of fun to compare what his expectations were to how it actually came out. You might be surprised by how often he actually got pretty close. You won't be surprised by how many times the story grew from his original uh, conception, because that's what we all have come to expect. <laughs> After all, A Feast for Crows itself is a growth of the story that was not planned in the first place. It was, it's a replacement for the five-year gap, as well as A Dance with Dragons. Although, not fully replaced, some of the ideas were simply changed in the timeline, pulled forward. Anyway, 
Well, let's get to it. The first one is Danny. And here's the notes. We he, it, it writes, or it says rather, pretend it's a horse. Face off in pit. No? Question mark. Mary? City. Battle scene. Quote, I'm going home. One chapter. Then page three. Danny. Her marriage. One. Fall of Astapor. Two. Siege of Marine. Bloody flux. Three. Climax. Dragons loosed. And four. Marriage. And then the number seven, which we've learned is an indication of how many chapters he expects. So he expected fa- expected one chapter before all this, and then seven chapters to cover the fall of Astapor, Siege of Marine, the Climax, and the Dragons Loosed, and then Marriage. Now, in, that's not the order they happened in, as you might have noticed. The Dragons were loosed way after her marriage, and she wasn't even there when it happened. Uh, that's when Quentin does that, and she's on the Dothraki Sea when that happens. So that's a big change. So he originally planned on the marriage coming later after the dragons were loose, which is pretty interesting. I wonder how that would have gone. The dragons are just rampaging around and she gets married. I suppose that's been slightly altered in that Drogon had already been loose and the other two were chained up. And well, maybe the marriage, maybe the original plan was for the marriage to happen, for Drogon to show up at the marriage rather. That would have been quite crazy. The, the line, pretend it's a horse, Most likely refers to riding Drogon for the first time. Just think of it like a horse, like she's trying to psych herself up and and climb on. That guess I feel pretty strong about. There's also a chance it refers to the Pale Mare, but why would you pretend the Pale... Like, the Pale Mare is a metaphor for disease, where this is pretend it's a horse. That doesn't sound very metaphorical at all. It sounds like she's uh, thinking of an actual horse. (laughs) So, mm, probably not the Pale Mare, though. I think that's worth a mention, at least, because that is at least horse-related and... We're trying to uncover all the stones here. Un- leave no stone unturned, rather. And thinking about dragon riding practicalities is perhaps where George is getting into this. Like, he hasn't had... At this point in the story, he hadn't written The World of Ice and Fire. He hadn't written Fire and Blood. So writing about dragon riding, having it be something hands-on, hadn't happened yet. We hadn't seen the physicalities of that we haven't seen the reality of like where do you hold on where do you grab where's what's a saddle look like so this would have been the first time he was thinking about some of those things and this is when he would be coming up with the some of those nitty-gritty details like we talked about i believe it was last episode or the episode before where if you guide a dragon you dig your heel into the left flank it turns left unlike a horse if you dig your heel into the left flank it turns right this is pro- the kind of idea that George was probably coming up with around this time. This, the particulars of the perspective of being on the dragon's back and riding and what's going to happen. Now, it says face off in pit. That seems to have happened. I mean, she mounts Drogon in Daznak's pit. That could be the battle scene that's referred to as well. After all, there there's the breakdown in order there during the gladiatorial games and Drogon shows up and people try to attack Drogon but it's really just the one guy it's not like the tv show where there's a whole bunch of harpies or guys running around trying to kill Danny and Jorah and do kill Hisdar so there isn't any specific battle that in the books around that time that I can think of that would actually fit this though there are certainly battles going on outside the city but still I don't think those are being referred to here it may be that he originally planned on having the Harpy uh, make an attack. The Sons of the Harpy descend on Daznak's pit, like they did in the show, which might explain why the show went ahead with that. Maybe they saw these notes. Which, by the way, we do have a section at the end on how these notes might have been used by the showrunners, because some of the things in here are not in the books, but are in the show. So the only way to that we could figure out to square that circle is to say, well, maybe George showed them some of these notes or notes that were like them. And then he changed his mind for the books, but they kept (laughs) those original outline notes and and stayed on that. So mm, not really sure. But uh, Nina suggests maybe the battle is Danny's combined Miranese forces facing off the combined Yunkish Carthian pro-slaver alliance. In other words, what we see in Barristan's chapters in The Winds of Winter, the actual battles where... You know, Victorian shows up during it (laughs) and all that becomes quite a to do. It's really quite interesting, really quite fun, really quite chaotic right up there with what's happening 
at the wall with John, which we'll be talking about today also. So the phrase, I'm going home, that's pretty straightforward, but it hasn't happened yet, right? It, it, you would think that Danny would say, yeah, I'm going home. I've done all these things. Maybe that's after her marriage, which again, that happens in the show, right? At the end of season six, five, I don't remember. She talks about, she's, the dragons are loose. She defeats the, all the boats and then is like, I'm going home. And so I figure maybe that was George's plan here too, but he's clearly delayed that because Instead of going home directly from the dragons being loosed, she's not even there. She's in the Dothraki Sea. She's going east before she goes west, I guess, is, is the idea here. And she's got stuff to do up there. And it's going to be a little bit longer. Now, another one of those notes is the fall of Astapor. In fact, it's the first one. Remember, number one, fall of Astapor. Number two, siege of marine slash bloody flux. Number three, climax slash dragons loose. Number four slash marriage. Seven chapters. He expected that to take seven chapters. He wasn't actually that far off as far as for him. It took uh, 10, there's 10 A Dance of Dragons chapters for Danny and none for a Feast for Crows. So he has one chapter, then seven chapters. So if you add that together, that's eight. He wasn't that far off. It's not bad. It turned out to be 10. Eh, yeah. He didn't, he was wrong about which book they'd be in, <laughs> but <laughs> he was right about the number, uh, reasonably so anyway. Not, not correctly, not directly right, but close enough. Uh, what else do we have here? Fall of Astapor. Of course, by the time a Feast for Crows happens, Astapor has already fallen twice. <laughs> so George is talking about the third fall, which does happen during A Dance with Dragons. Remember, the first fall of Astapor was Danny's awesome trick to get the Unsullied and pull a fast one on the slavers with Drogon. The second was after she overthrows them, she leaves behind a council of rulers, and those rulers get overthrown by Cleon the Butcher. And the third is when Cleon is overthrown and his immediate successors, those who try to strap his body on a on a horse and try to pretend he's still alive, or they're overthrown by the Yunkai, and that's seen directly from the point of view of Quentin, uh, who signed on to the Windblown as a part of his secret plan to get to Danny. But we can be very sure that Quentin was added on in the midst of all this. Quentin was not part of the original plan. So a lot of these things that George was wrestling here became the Quentin chapters and the Barristan chapters. Because none of this stuff here indicates her being gone. None of these notes show her being away from the city uh, for any length of time. There's no mention of returning to the Thraki. There's no mention of the very telling uh, moments from her early dreams that show like the crones from the Dash Colleen bending the knee to her. I think George had ga given up on that idea entirely. He's like, well, scrapping the five-year gap means scrapping that. And then he backtracked and said, actually, we can still do that. It's too important or it's too fun or too cool. Whatever his internal reasoning for it was, I believe he gave up on it and then came back to it. I think that's what that's telling us here. But again, we have to be too careful with that line of thinking because just because it's not mentioned here doesn't mean he didn't have other notes elsewhere. But I feel pretty good about that that theory. So, Young Kai, if we go back to the fall of the second fall of Astapor before it's over, before Cleon is overthrown, this is when Cleon does the overthrowing. There's refugees streaming from Astapor away from the Yunkish forces, and they bring the Pale Mare with them. And that's part of where the problem comes. Now, in these notes, it says Bloody Flux. I'm pretty sure we can very safely assume that George meant the same thing here. Bloody Flux, Pale Mare, it's just a different disease or the same disease with a different name. I think it is the same disease with a different name. I've never been 100% clear on that, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, so, yeah, Nina says, with regards to the marriage after the dragons were loosed idea, she says, I wonder whether George was debating a very early version of the Quentin story, having someone tempt Danny into a marriage to return home to Westeros that she then turns down because she realizes she isn't finished with Marine. If she leaves Marine, they're doomed. The people that she saved, it, it will have been pointless. All her efforts will be undone. So she has to stay to in order to fix that. And that would mean marrying someone like a Hisdar rather than marrying a Quentin. At that point, he may not have decided who this person even was, but some Westerosi. Uh, he probably had it narrowed down because there's not a lot of options. I mean, he couldn't have been a Stark. I mean, <laughs> there's just couldn't have been a, 
a Greyjoy, I guess, although the Greyjoys are coming for her, but not in a way that she would want. I mean, it's an easy turndown. <laughs> if if, uh, if Euron had come or Victorian comes, she can easily just say no to that. But of course, they aren't planning to ask. So that's 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 why we can be pretty sure it's not being what, what's referred to here. And Dorne fits perfectly. There, there's an extra son in there already. And it's part of why George added extra characters, extra descendants to a lot of these families so that he would have options. And this one paid off. Having Quentin allowed him to create this plot line. He'd already had you. He'd already assigned Tristane to be married to <laughs> betrothed to Marcella, rather. So he was kind of used already. That that piece was off the board. But Quentin, he had he had left open, and yeah, it really worked out for him. Super chat from a long accepted, a long expected, excuse me, soundscape. Hey Jordan, how you doing? Says I've been excited to spend this chill day enjoying the stream. Thank you guys so much for doing this. Happy holidays. Happy holidays to you all as well, wherever you are and whoever you're spending the time with. Hope you're, having, hope you're having a wonderful time and hope we're staying warm. Not too warm, though. Not dragon warm. We don't need that much. So, yeah, there's a lot there with Danny, and I think it's super interesting The seeing how George morphed it from something that seemed fairly straightforward to something that's... I wouldn't call it convoluted, but it's definitely a lot more than he had here. It's a lot more than he planned. And you can see why it's not something he could have just planned right away. This kind of idea doesn't just come one day. You got to, this is idea piled on top of idea, on top, piled on top of idea. Considered, reconsidered, restructured, domino effect of changing the first thing changes all the others. And start to see why some of these things take so long. Now, I mentioned Euron and Victorian. It's pretty confirmed from other notes, not from here, but some of the A Feast for Crows notes that were released in another time, and not handwritten notes, mind you, because, again, handwritten notes are extremely rare, that he did originally have Euron going to Danny directly rather than sending Victorian. The corpse at the prow of the ship, being as vague as it was, allowed it to be a different Greyjoy. It could be Victorian, it could be Euron, it could be even be Theon. That was a theory for a while. It could even be John Connington, but it's it's probably not John Connington. But it, because it was originally Euron, it makes some of the other things fit, like the core, the the blue eyed dude with the freezing cold member that she has dreams of. That's still meant to be Euron, even though Euron isn't coming to her directly. He can she can still encounter him in Westeros. Who knows how that's going to play out? But it does seem that. The original plan was for Euron to come to Slaver's Bay directly, and then who knows what would happen there, but it might be, it would preclude the need for Victorian to do that, and would very much change the state of the High Tower and what's going to happen there. So I think I like this version better, but I'm always curious about the, the what could have been. Let's move on to Sam slash Jamie. And it's Sam slash Jamie because that's how it's shown. And the way the note's written, it's very, it's extremely sparse. It just says, Sam, cut. And Sam is actually crossed out. <laughs> and then it says, Jamie, blackfish. That's the only note for Jamie is blackfish. And the only note for Sam is cut. <laughs> well, let me tell you. It's sort of written to appear that Jamie replaced Sam. Like he was going to put Sam in this book and he decided to replace him with Jamie. But of course, Sam is in A Feast for Crows. And he he wasn't cut in any form that we can tell. And he's not in A Dance with Dragons. So there is that. But, and for John, it's the reverse, of course. John, not in A Feast for Crows, but is in A Dance with Dragons. Of course, that's relevant because Sam and John obviously start off in the same location, and then Sam goes to Old Town, or Bravos, then Old Town, so uh, that, he obviously moves to a different theater of the story, and it's interesting, too, that he has, John has the most chapters, by the way, in A Dance with Dragons, so, well, oh, actually, the, sorry, the third more, uh, no, he has the most, yeah, he has the most in A Dance with Dragons, uh, slightly more than Tyrion, Danny's in third, and even though there's only one note here for Jamie Blackfish, Jamie ends up with seven chapters in the book, which is the third most <laughs> of anyone. So he's the third most uh, featured character in A Feast for Crows. And it seems that he was probably not planned on having a lot of chapters. I think George really grew Jamie, uh, his role in A Feast for Crows. I think he planned a big role for him in Storm of Swords. It went great, but I think he planned on backing down on that, backing off on having it be... Uh, 
a smaller character of less chapters, but then stuff happened. And that's what, and this is where we ended up. He loved the idea. I think Nina points out of having a standoff between Jamie and Brendan. It seems that's really important. Jamie struggles with what makes a night, what a good night is having him be confronted by his childhood hero. Someone who he looked up to as the ideal of a knight, one of the best examples of someone having him be told off by his childhood hero. That's pretty important for a person who's having, again, we, we don't want to necessarily call it a redemption arc, but major character growth, you know, changing. He's thinking about things in ways he hadn't thought about before. He's discovering sympathies and empathy that he didn't have before. He's discovering honor after thinking it was kind of a lost cause, he's coming around to it. And I'm not just talking about his horse, but so the George clearly saw the, the value, the, the gravitas of this moment. And it was great. Jamie and Blackfish, their, their conversation was amazing and loaded with subtlety and bluntness and just lots of great one-liners and dialogue. It's just a really great moment. And Jamie is pretty, I mean, he he puts on a brave face, but he's a little he's a little disappointed. You know, he he thought uh, things would go differently <laughs> with with Blackfish, and then he had to go, well, quote unquote, had to go with his his threat to Ed Muir, and then Blackfish escapes, and well, then it gets into a whole other plot line. But that is not really detailed here. It's not mentioned here whether Jamie's going to... It's sort of implied, though. The fact that Jamie's going to deal with Blackfish, I guess George had probably already planned what was going to happen to Blackfish in the long term. Maybe not the whole thing, but the idea that he gets away and continues to lead things from a guerrilla warfare angle or start something up from the Riverlands, maybe hooks up with a brother without banners. I don't know exactly how much of that he planned, obviously, but it seems like he did plan some of it and wanted it to this to be like a pivot point from that. So he has to face himself down. Jamie has to decide whether he really wants to do destroy the house of, of someone he respected and uh, whether that's going to come back and haunt him later or whether Blackfish is going to come back and haunt him later. I think we're all very curious to see. but. It's very interesting to see that George had this moment particularly picked out as a, a crucial moment for Jamie, and the rest is what kind of grew around it. It's quite possible he only planned two chapters, one, maybe only one for Jamie in this book originally, and well, yeah, it certainly ended up with a lot more than that. A character who is in a similar place and also in a similar uh, arc in terms of overlapping is Brienne. The one note on Brienne here is four words end with hound fight. Now that is tricky because the hound, it doesn't say Sandor Clegane. Of course, she doesn't fight Sandor Clegane. She does in the show, <laughs> but she does fight the hound, the current hound, meaning the guy wearing the hound helmet. Not the actual hound, of course, not the Sandor Clegane, but she does end A Feast for Crows with the fight against Rorge wearing the hound's helmet. And then, you know, Biter sits on her and tries to start eating her and Gendry kills Biter. And then she's taken captive. So it's actually not her last chapter. Her last chapter is being, is being put in captivity and facing Lady Stoneheart and almost being hanged. But George didn't extend too far beyond that he wanted to her maybe to have this be the climactic moment you're not quite sure what happens to the hound at this point we don't even know which hound he intended probably not sandor clagane but possibly he may have intended sandor clagane to heal up sooner um i mean if he all if he planned all along on sandor not dying which i think he did given the way he wrote it in a storm of swords that's not how you certainly written amb unambig or written ambiguously he certainly gave himself the option to leave sandor alive maybe he hadn't fully decided but i would guess that he had and yeah why not assume that there's a chance he possibly planned on having sandor heal up sooner and maybe encountering ari or maybe encountering brienne and them fighting for whatever reason i'm not sure why they would fight that is partly why i get hung up in the show they fight over aria 
but they <clears throat> she's right there right Brienne Arya doesn't want to go with Brienne but Brienne's like I swore an oath to bring you to Lady Catelyn etc cetera, etc cetera. but there's not going to be an Arya there in this case Arya's gone to Bravos by the end of A Storm of Swords so there's no chance she would be the thing they would fight over here maybe they fight over the idea of her but that doesn't seem very likely so Maybe that's what George Randage is like. I don't know why they would be fighting. Or maybe he just never intended that at all. Maybe he always meant that it would be someone wearing the Hound's helm. But he hadn't decided who. Who is it going to be? He only knew that it wouldn't be Sandor Clegane. Would it be Lem, who wears it after? Or maybe Rorge is one of the original ideas, and he settled on that. There's maybe a few other possibilities on who he might have given the Hound's head helmet to. Maybe he could give it to... Uh, Sir Creighton Longbow, <laughs> or or Sir Illifer the Penniless, one of those two knights that <laughs> that Brienne wear, runs into, or uh, Sir Shadrick the Mad Mouse with a hound's head helmet on, <laughs> It'd be way too big for him. That guy's like five foot six, and Sandor's like six foot six. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so it's interesting to see. This is something that's going to repeat itself throughout these notes. Is George referring to a character by their nickname, and it's a nickname that multiple people have. And it's a, people that multiple multiple identities. So the Hound is a, is a good one of that. Another example of that later is going to be Aegon. Or which Aegon are we talking about? Another one is the Shrouded Lord. Well, which, who is the Shrouded Lord? We don't even know who that is, but there's all these nicknames. So I, I think the intent all along was to fight the Hound. George just had to figure out which Hound and what order to place that all in. And now... This is that one note, four words, yet Brienne is the second biggest part of the book. She has the most chapters other than Cersei. Second most POV time in A Feast for Crows. <laughs> so that's really telling. George clearly added Brienne, a lot of Brienne. He must have decided to add a little Brienne, and then maybe he was just enjoying himself, writing her, enjoying the, the knight errant style and her chapters are awfully popular within the deeper fandom and i don't know he just had fun with it he was covering some of the, the bases he wanted to cover uh he went he hadn't always planned on the five-year gap being scrapped so he had to invent some new content and brienne one of the biggest parts of that i think it's kind of been known but maybe not to this degree we maybe didn't realize how much so Next up, we have Davos. Davos, Davos. Barrowton wedding. Davos to take recaptured Arya North. Quote, where are you going? Answer, to a wedding. Okay. A lot of unpacking here. This one's pretty interesting. He might be saying to a wedding to Lord Godric or to Salador San. Those are people he has conversations with at the beginning of his A Dance with Dragons arc because, of course, he's... Uh, not in A Feast for Crows. <laughs> and he might be saying that because, right, he's, he lands on the sisters and they're asking him where his final destination is. And he says he's going to White Harbor there. But that's because the plans changed, right? He originally was going to have a Barrowton wedding. So having Davos go there makes sense because that's where the wedding was going to be instead of Winterfell. In world, it changes. It's not just something George changed his mind on. Roose Bolton changes his mind. The original plan was for Ramsay to marry Jane Poole Arya at Barrowton. But Roose tells Ramsay at in the chapter where he they talk and Theon is the witness to it, where he takes Theon back and tells Ramsey, you know, I don't make me rue the day I raped your mother. All that awful business. He tells him he's changing the plan. He's like, okay, I'm going to, I've decided it makes more sense for you to get married at Winterfell. It's more symbolic. It's more, it's a bit more, more of a power move than doing it here in Barrowton. Partly because Bar partly because Lady Dustin hates you. <laughs> she, and, you know, she won't even let you in her castle. So that's another angle to this. Now, we know, thanks to G. Steph from the Cushing Library notes, that the original, well, an original conception for this, I should, I should always stop myself from saying the original conception. We don't know what the original conception was. Only George does, and he may have forgotten. But a, a prior conception of this event 
before it was Winterfell, was not only Barrington, but it was going to be a triple marriage. Janelle Serwin was going to marry Crow Foods uh, Umber, and Roger Riswell was going to marry one of the Walder Freys. The, the best guess pair, appears to be Fair Walder, but doesn't matter. Didn't, it didn't happen. And I'll take Nina's note on this one. She says, probably a good idea. It would have undercut the terror of Jane as Arya and all the post-wedding stuff and how abusive uh, Ramsay is to her. And that wouldn't be as focused on if it's the wedding is sharing a spotlight with two kind of ordinary marriages that are not particularly outstanding as far as weddings in this setting go. It, it, those aren't a big deal, right? They're, they show the Bolton attempts to gain more power in the North, but you don't need to see that. You can just hear about the weddings or talk about them. They, they can be done off page. Having having the focus be on Jane's suffering and how that is m changing people's minds, or that's like a, a thing that people are talking about, an undercurrent of unease, or if not downright terror, the thing that Lady Dustin says to Theon, like they better learn to, he better learn to treat her better, or, you know, they're going to, he's going to lose some allies, if not more, because they love the Starks. Now, but what is this line about take recaptured Arya North? What does that mean? Well, I think the original idea was what happened in A Dance with Dragons. Arya did get recaptured and ran north. She's headed, she gets taken by Stannis instead of goes to the wall. But the idea was, you know, Theon flees with Jane Poole and they escape and so recaptured, quote unquote. And it ends up in the same place. You have Davos taking recaptured Arya to Stannis in these notes. Well, presumably to Stannis is take him, take her north. I can, I can presume that's who he's taking her to. Uh, but the same thing happens, and it goes to still goes to Stannis's faction. Stannis just gets her directly, or her, meaning Jane Poole, uh, instead of getting her through Davos. So I guess the idea wasn't to have Mance infiltrate this wedding, or maybe it was. Maybe Davos was going to be there, and Davos was going to hook up with Mance. Uh, via the rattle shirt armor and have all that happen or something, maybe instead of Theon, instead of Theon being the witness to it and being the part the the party that helps her escape. So I guess the original plan was for Davos to sort of take Theon's role at the wedding, to be the witness to it, to maybe even talk to Lady Dustin, maybe some of that stuff. You know, because I really wonder was was George gonna when's George's plan to bring Theon back out of the the Dreadfort dungeons, it might originally have been a lot longer time. He might have been in that dungeon the whole five year gap. That might partly explain why he's just so so extremely uh, it's extremely apparent how much torture he's been through, like his hair turning white. He looks so much older than he is that that sort of fits with him being in prison even longer. Not that we need that because his torture was so awful that, I mean, and what do I know about <laughs> what your body does under those conditions? Still, it would fit if he had planned on Theon being in prison longer and then came up with the idea of using Theon for a lot of these other plot lines and maybe even using him to uh, get a little, a little bit of redemption by helping Jane Poole escape and maybe do some other things later. So the idea of Mance coming in and infiltrating it using the glamours and all that other stuff, there's nothing in the notes about that. There's maybe a tidbit in John's notes, which we'll get to later, that maybe ties into this. But I don't know. This this might have been something, a later addition, that the original plan was to have Davos do a lot of this, him be the POV, him be the one at the wedding instead of at White Harbor. So I think that what George did was he just kind of, he just kind of twisted the, the dial instead of Davos being... On the Arya plot that was given to Theon, and Davos gets involved in the Rickon plot instead, right? He's just a different spoke on the Stark succession crisis. It's like, oh, instead of me being part of the Arya plot, I'm part of the Rickon plot. So he's still part of the Stark succession crisis, still part of the Stark heirs business, and he's still smuggling. He's still like doing a shipborne thing. They needed him because he's good at he's a particularly good smuggler, and they didn't wanted to keep their distance from the mission. It looks like someone that. Like, a, Wyman Manderley's angle on having Davos do it is many things, one of which is it keeps his involvement of it a secret. Like, none of his agents are involved. So if he gets if Davos gets caught, it looks like Stannis' business entirely. There's no connection to Wyman at all. 
And that fits pretty well. Uh, there's a note later in the Sansa notes that there's news, quote unquote, news from White Harbor. There's a lot of things that news from White Harbor could be. But I'm reminded of the idea that there's no Manderly stuff here at all, right? None of the notes about Davos talk about Manderly. That was obviously changed later. And there's no, there's almost no other Manderly thing anywhere in any of these notes except for that little bit about Sansa that I just mentioned. Let's not forget the name of Rickon's wolf, Shaggy Dog. The Shaggy Dog story is a story that goes nowhere. George is making an in-joke to other writers or to people who get the joke that Rickon and Shaggy Dog are not important characters. <laughs> but it really seems like he changed his mind. It's a way for him to sort of change his in-joke to a double-level joke. Oh, actually, this character is important, or at least kind of important, because he's probably wasn't part of this. George probably added all this on later. He's like, well, let's make Rick an important after all. I can't have Davos do this. Let's have Davos do this. Ooh, this is fun. Go to Skagos. Yeah. And maybe Rickon was at White Harbor originally. Remember, that was what they said. Osha's like, where are you going to go? Or Osha asks, rather, Osha asks Lewin, where should I take the kids? Where should I take them? And he's like, I don't know, the Umbers maybe? White Harbor? I'm not sure. It's dangerous and I'm dying. So it's hard for me to think straight. Good example of gardening by her, him throwing out several names, right? Several possibilities for her to think of. That way George can leave it for himself to decide. He's like, well, I, I picked one of those names. Yeah, I picked one of them. I didn't, <laughs> you know, he's able to decide, well, later I can choose White Harbor or the umbers or both or something like that or wrap them all together and uh it just kind of landed that way right uh he didn't plan on white harbor being as important at least at that point but it really worked he had set it up in a way that rickon could have been at white harbor instead of skagos he never confirmed he was at skagos until the chapter where Wyman sends him there. We didn't know he was there until he's like, go to Skagos. <laughs> and we're like, the North remembers. It's, it's an unbelievable end to a chapter. Remember, folks, when we covered that chapter specifically, there's fairly strong evidence that it's the most popular chapter of all of A Song of Ice and Fire by m multiple time readers. So it's hard to argue that George didn't land on an amazing final spot with all these various ideas that he was trying to juggle the Arya, the theon the davos the rickon the stannis the boltons the the sh the wolves and the people working on restoring the starks whoever that might be uh, at this point we have a pretty good idea of the big players but there's probably people waiting to change sides or willing to change sides just with a couple of things happening and the emergence of a Rickon or an Arya might be that emergence of both of them might be even better. And yeah. So let's see any other notes about this one. Yeah. Barrett and wedding. So I love that idea, the way that it shifted both from Ramsey from Roos and from Davos. And I guess Manderly as well, because there is some confusion even within the text about where some of these things happen. Like when did Mance Raider connect with Wyman Manderly? Cause it seems like they might be working together. Did they connect outside or have they contacted each other once they were at Winterfell? It's not clear, but it all fits into this general, under this umbrella of what George was trying to do here with handling Stannis, versus the Boltons with all the different moving pieces that are attached to that while also handling the Starks. Okay, let's move on to the prologue. Interesting, George wrote it just as P-R-O-L-O-G, like he abbreviated it. <laughs> he wrote... No, actually, he was saying he's prologue. <laughs> he likes logs. <laughs> yeah, Yule log. <laughs> it is that time of year, Yule logs, that's right. One of the problems i run into without having a sean here is that i don't have time to take a drink so well how about that. i talk about how i have casanova climbing all over me right now that is a that is a, a very worthy thing to point out he's a good boy that casanova it's good to have a cat in your lap when you're live streaming let me tell you unless they're pressing buttons 
So the note on prologue is no glass candles, dash, pate, dash, steals book, period, death of dragons. Ooh, right? This touches on a, a pre-existing theory and another pre-existing theory or several pre-existing theories, depending on how you view glass candles. So this refers to earlier notes where the original conception or an original conception and earlier conception, we'll say, for this plot line was Pate steals a glass candle for the alchemist. Now, why, though? Why? What was the point of having him steal a glass candle? So he can see what Danny's doing? So he can get into Danny's head? Well, that gets into glass candle mysteries. What is the point of the glass candles? What is their narrative purpose? What can they even do? I mean, we know some of the things they can do, but, like, what else can they do? And how strongly can they do it? And who knows how to do it? Who knows how to use those things? And this is part of the reason glass candle stuff seems so obscure and, and hard to pin down in the books is because George set something up for them and then changed his mind. And at this point, it's unclear what the final plan for glass candles is at all. And there might not be much of a plan for it, but I think there will be because he did introduce them. They're cool. And I doubt he's just going to leave that hanging. But it's possible he does. So here he changed his mind to Pate stealing a book, the book, The Death of Dragons, a.k.a. Blood and Fire. But George eventually just seems to have decided to put another layer of subtlety in between that, another layer of obfuscation, instead of stealing the book, which would immediately tell us something. If we find out that a book called The Death of Dragons is missing in the text, that's very, very telling, right? A casual reader would probably get that. Be like, oh, well, Death of Dragons is a very specific title. And there's only a couple dragons in the series. We know faceless men don't like dragons. So, although actually that may be not that clear to readers at the point of this story, when this prologue comes around. So that, that last bit might be missed. But still, Death of Dragons and there's now dragons in the world. It's, it seems kind of straightforward, right? A lot more straightforward than a glass candle. But maybe that's the problem. It's too straightforward. If you have Pate steal a key, then you don't exactly know, as a reader, you don't know what J Jaken or the Faceless Man, if you don't know who he is, is after. He's just like, well, he wants a key to unlock something and steal something, which is like, ooh, what is that something? What is he trying to steal? It makes it more compelling in its mystery because he's not telling us what this book is about. Ultimately, he left the clues there. We all deep fandom, you know, our podcast, etc. A lot of other people figured out and make connected those dots when Tyrion talks about this book, A Death of Dragons, in the next book, A Dance with Dragons. <laughs> That's confusing. A Death of Dragons and A Dance with Dragons. That's what happens when you dance too hard, y'all. You you die. And so it is there. George left the clue for attentive readers, but he didn't want to make it too obvious. So he added that extra layer of obfuscation by making the key. So I, I love that. It's, it goes to show his writing style in a, in a really good way. He sh he's, he's aiming to, he gives the answer to people who are really attentive, to people who reread, while keeping it hidden from people who are going to be surprised when this book is revealed or when this book is busted out by someone. They're going to have, that, that's going to pop up on page and they're not going to re even remember that that thing was mentioned before. But we certainly will. You all will. And you'll be very excited and surprised and happy and, or whatever. Whatever emotions you experience, you won't just gloss over that name like a lot of more casual readers will. So, Pate also, the mystery is so grand because Pate thinks of how that door opens, I mean, that key opens every door at the Citadel. <laughs> so it's, Nina writes, he's quite literally left the door open <laughs> to write whatever he wants is the ending of that mystery. Even if he changes his mind on the death of dragons, we we wouldn't be too disappointed because he didn't actually spell that out. He, he, he suggested it very heavily, but if he changes his mind and just, the alchemist steals some other scroll that doesn't have a name. I would be slightly disappointed, but especially if it leads to the same basic thing, you know, where, what's a dragon's weaknesses? How do you kill a dragon? You know, et cetera. What, what are their weakness? What are their soft spots? <laughs> you know, what's their, do they have their certain kind of poison or an herb they're allergic to, you know? <laughs> so it's fairly simple. It's, it's a fairly simple evolution to think about this because when we analyze the prologue of A Feast for Crows a long time ago, remember, he wrote it from a number of different characters' point of views. He knew it was going to be one of the characters at the bar. 
he even considered Rosie herself, but he tried it as Pate, which is obviously what he settled on. But he he went with um, Molander and what are the other guys' names? Roan. Uh, I don't think he considered Sorella or Alaris, <laughs> same person. But maybe he did. I'm forgetting. He but he he went from a lot of he tried it a lot of different ways, and a lot of different versions of that floating around the different the book or the candle and all that. So. Again, I'm like, oh yeah, why would a, I keep, I, I've already brought this up and I, I can't keep coming back to it. Why would the faceless men want a glass candle? What was the idea with that? I, I definitely want to get ideas from y'all. If you have a thought on what, what, what a device that supposedly lets you enter someone's dreams or plant suggestions, what would the faceless men's angle on that be given their uh, opposition to dragons and Valyrians and stuff like that? Uh, I'm sure there's a way to manipulate a person through their brain, but like it seems so indirect for them. Like they're they're about killing, <laughs> not about well whatever a glass candle does. It's not murder. So I don't know. So the key, the glass candle, big mysteries already. Uh, so it's harder to unpack because we it's still. These are all plot lines still in progress. And it's also, by the way, easier to believe. Pate stealing the key from the maester, the archmaester is believable. But him, like, stealing a glass candle. He, he's not painted as the most competent guy. So I don't know if he'd be able to pull that off. The book, maybe he could pull off. But even that's a little... That involves him going into a a private area that lots of other maesters would be in and he'd have to explain himself away. This version, it just, he just steals a key from the guy's lockbox that's under his bed, which is, he's already his manservant, so he's already got a reason to be in his room and rifling through his stuff. And it seems to work better. Uh, there's other things that can be found there too. Just because we're told that the, the likely target of the faceless men in this citadel or in yeah in the citadel is this book the death of dragons aka blood and fire it doesn't mean it's the only thing he wants he's like well as long as i'm here and i got this master key that opens every door in the citadel why not do this or this or this also you know maybe nothing too far off of the beaten path like we can't have two separate faceless men plots going in this one mysterious character probably not but it could have some some wrinkles, some add-ons to it. It might be another way to give more backstory on the faceless men, what their ultimate goals are, what their you know what this particular agent, assuming he's still Jake and Hagar, what his deal is if he's a rogue, if he's got some mission, who gave him this mission? Like this isn't just a regular murder, obviously. This isn't just a regular old well, someone paid for this and we're doing it. I don't think they're stealing this book as part of a hit. I don't think they were stealing the glass candle as part of a hit. They might have been. They might have been. But it's hard to see that. Right? It's harder to perceive why that would be necessary. Unless the hit is the dragons. <laughs> that that might be easier to see. Not from the glass candles, but from the book. So, ooh, that, that one really, uh... That one's really cool. I really like that one. It does seem to confirm... I mean, this, this, this theory of the Death of Dragons book is the, the book that is important here. It's been around, well, ever since the Dance of Dragons came out. This seems to really verify how important that was, how big a deal it was for George from years before the book even came out. So that is telling. Let's move on to Kevin, as in Kevin Lannister. I don't know what other Kevin I could possibly mean, but I put this one next because it's an epilogue or finished as an epilogue of A Dance with Dragons, whereas... This last one we just discussed was the prologue to A Feast for Crows. Which is the beginning and end of the completed material we have from this these uh, what these notes are referring to. Was this always planned as an epilogue? Here's what it says. There's two notes for Kevin. Home to Casterly Rock and Ready for Winter. Now, both those things basically happened but not quite in the way that these notes indicate. Or maybe they do. They're very close though. So, again, Cersei ended up with such a huge number of chapters in A Feast for Crows. And earlier we talked about maybe Jamie didn't originally have such a, so many allocated to him. So it's entirely possible George considered Kevin for more than one chapter. And finally settled on using him in the epilogue. Here I'll explain why. The, the ready for winter note 
does happen in his one chapter, the epilogue. Uh, the White Raven shows up during that chapter. But, yeah, maybe maybe Kevin was going to get some of the chapters that Jamie got. Maybe going through the Riverlands. Maybe some of that was going to be his. Uh, I think it's a good decision to give it to Jamie. Jamie's a far more important character, far more compelling character. But if if George was stuck, you know, Kevin could have served to, you know, get over a narrative hump, so to speak. This was, of course, changed a little bit. He ends the book as Hand of the King at the Red Keep and is killed. But he does go back to Casterly Rock to take Tywin's bones home. He's gone for a while on that trip, on that trek. And then he returns to the Red Keep and becomes Hand of the King. Now, he, Cersei originally had offered him that job. And he's like, only if you, I'll do it, but only if you take, remove yourself as regent and go back to Casterly Rock. And she's offended and, you know, isn't down for that. One version of that early chapter, I recall, had George, this was posted to uh, Westeros.org at the time. George really foreshadowed Kevin's death by Cer having Cersei throw a, her wine in his face and having a, a dribble of wine just sort of hang on his Adam's apple and just kind of quiver there for a minute before dropping. And it's like, you know, showing that uh, the the red at his neck and it sim symbolizes or slash foreshadows his death, which does come, though it doesn't come at Cersei's hands, which may have been what that seemed to indicate was going to happen. Uh, instead, it's on Cersei's behest, on Cersei's behalf, not on Cersei's behest, rather. Varys explicitly kills <clears throat> Kevin and tells him, Cersei was doing a great job screwing things up, and that's what we wanted. You were fixing things, so we need to put her back in charge. So <laughs> it's not that Cersei uh, is the one that goes and murders Kevin by him herself and thus regains power. It's that Varys is like, you know, my faction is going to do better with her in charge because <laughs> she's just running this ship into the ground and that that works for us we want her to run it into the ground so it could have been a, a different uh, conception of this could have just been that kevin is hand earlier or that cersei murders kevin directly rather than having varus do it uh, on his own accord entirely possible and either way we end up in the same place we are now with which is with mace tyrell's hand he takes over after Kevin's death. That's That could have just happened a little earlier, right? He was already uh, ruling in that regard. Or rather, he's already ruling his hand and Kevin is, is, uh, is ruling his regent. I was saying that wrong. Kevin's been regent. So basically ruling in the same level of authority. And we see how Mace Tyrell is just obviously pushing pushing things around. He's got his giant chair that looks like a throne and he's acting all imperious and acting like he's in charge when he's it's it's a coalition. And that is uh pretty similar though to what 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 we we end up with. So this is maybe changed less than some of these other things. And recall as well that when Kevin is back at Cashley Rock, he's talking to Cersei having dinner with her with the kittens <laughs> and talking about Tommen and all that. Not with the kittens, but talking about them. And Cersei asks if if he's going to bring his wife to court. Asked Jamie or asked Kevin if he's going to bring his wife Dorna to court, and he's like, "No, she'd be as happy as one of Tommen's ki kittens in a pit of vipers." Well, he doesn't say that; he thinks that. <laughs> so, yeah. And then, <clears throat> getting back to the winter part, remember he goes to Pycelle's chambers to talk to him. It's super cold. He sees the White Raven in the window, and then he notices what's happened to Pycelle. He said, or rather, he he says winter to himself. He whispers it as he's realizing the significance of the White Raven, and he's shot. It's the last word he says before he's shot. Then he, you know, says a few things while he's lying out, bleeding out on the ground. And one question would be though, if George's original plan was to have him end at Casterly Rock. Well, then he wouldn't have died there, I don't think. Like, how is he going to die at Casterly Rock? Like, that's the one, one of the most locked down locations there is. Like, I don't suppose we're going to have, like, a second faceless man off him in Casterly Rock. Because, for one, why? Why would a faceless man kill Kevin? That doesn't make much sense. They don't seem to be involved in in the Lannister business at all right now. Uh, 
so that doesn't really add up. Or just Kevin wouldn't have died. Maybe Kevin would have just existed at Cashley Rock for a while and then died at some point later, you know? Or maybe Kevin's the guy who's at Casterly Rock when Tyrion arrives and, and takes it back over using his trick of the, the water pipes or whatever is going to happen. Who knows how that's actually going to play out. But the, maybe the original plan was for it to be Tyrion versus Kevin. That would have been kind of interesting, having uh, his father's brother, his uncle, as the, the man in charge of uh, defenses or of being a, a higher up, if not the highest up, in the Lannister chain of command at that point in the story. Uh, so maybe he's, the plan wasn't for him to die then. But on the other hand, there's these other early indications well before the book came out that the plan was for Kevin to die. So hmm, I'm not sure. He may have toyed with it. He may have considered the merits of a Kevin Lannister death or not <laughs> at various points in the story and just settled on, yeah, Varus, you get to do it. You get it, Varus. Varus giggles with glee. And remember, too, that the plan for the prologue of the Winds of Winter, at last we've been told, George says that Jane Westerling will be in it. Not that she's the POV, but that she'll be in it. And that train of people that she's in is headed towards Cashley Rock. So some of the ideas that might have been that George might have planned to use for that might have come out here instead with, with Kevin and Cersei. So the Kevin stuff might have been originally wrapped up in the, the Jane Westerling stuff, but not as it turned out. And I do wonder how the Brotherhood Without Banners will wrap into all that as well, but probably won't have anything to do with uh, the continuing, the, the, out, the, the fallout of Kevin's death because it seems irrelevant to him. That's all about the Tyrells now and about Cersei. Speaking of Cersei... Let's talk about Cersei. Another one where the notes are a little bit sparse. It says, Kettleblack, quote, Queen asked me to say that. Quote, Osmond betrays her. And I say, quote, Osmond, it's Osmond is in quotes, betrays her. It's like, why is Osmond is like, Osmond betrays her. Wait, is it not Osmond that betrays her? Does she think Osmond betrays her? This is perhaps the best example of a POV character growing as George waters the seeds. Cersei was watered a lot. Cersei, <laughs> she is cersei here, not Cersei. Because again, it's a fairly sparse set of notes for a character who has the most POV screen time by far of any character in A Feast for Crows. By far. She has 22% of the book. 22% of A Feast for Crows is Cersei chapters. That is not only the most in A Feast for Crows, that's the most in any book. 22% is the most any character has in any of the books. Yeah, Ned doesn't have 22% of A Game of Thrones. It's like 18%, something like that. It's, it's pretty high, but it's not 22%. So, and these are 45 minute chapters and there's 10 of them. <laughs> That's their average, 45 minutes on average, 10 of them. And she's got two more to dance with dragons. So uh, the plan was for maybe a couple and it ended up with 12 <laughs> between the two books. So yeah, go Cersei. And we're grateful. Just like the additions of Brienne and some of Jamie. Those are awesome chapters, even if you can argue that they took the story in a direction that made it more harder to finish or harder to keep track of. Yeah, those are, I'm not going to argue with that. It is harder to keep track of. The bigger the story gets, the harder it gets to keep track of. That's, that's true. I mean, that's basic to say that, to make that point. So yeah, but that's not a problem for me. You know, personally, I don't mind it being more complicated. I don't, I don't want it to be convoluted. I don't want it to be too confusing. And it is in a few places, but it's not like an overwhelming problem. And I wouldn't even call it a problem. It's not an overwhelming thing, we'll say. So, but he, and he had work to do. Like he changed, it's a big change. Getting rid of the five-year gap means you got to add quite a bit of stuff. And the stuff happening at King's Landing is really important. Stuff happening in Dorne is really important. The stuff happening in the Iron Islands is pretty important too. And that's where a lot of the expansion of the story came, of course. But Brienne is a little different because, you know, she wasn't really part of those stories specifically. She's kind of her own story. So Cersei, yeah, I mean, Cersei chapters are extremely popular. I'm not sure whether Cersei pop chapters are more popular than Brienne chapters in among our listeners. I bet, I bet it's pretty close because they're both very beloved. Now, the Kettle Blacks have long been a part of Cersei's story, and there was pretty significant expansion on their role. Rather, a lot of it was somewhat coming to an end, maybe. It's, it really came to, we'll say it came to a head, maybe not an end. 
he probably long had a plan of using them as part of Cersei's downfall, or at least gave himself that option. Because, as we said, we know since A Clash of Kings, that Tyrion was turning them into double agents, right? So they've already been, they're already kind of a setup for her downfall, if George wanted to go that way. They already know things about her, they already can, they can bring her down with them, etc. Now, where it was expanded, though, is that we find out in A Feast for Crows that actually, yes, they're double agents for Tyrion, but they're triple agents for Littlefinger. And it's funny to call them triple agents because there's three of them. If you count their father, then there's four, but he's not in King's Landing. He's up with, with uh, at least he's not now. He's currently up at uh, in the Erie, although he is very concerned about what's happened to his three sons since they're all in big trouble. So yeah, so she tells some big lies. It backfires pretty badly, and the three Kettle Blacks are um, caught up in those lies or and or are responsible for some of those lies and fornications. Two of them sleep with Cersei, and one of them murders the previous High Septon. That's let's not forget that crime. That was you know they the, the faith comes after Cersei for a lot of things, and to be fair, that's a big one. <laughs> Killing the High Septon, they do frown on that. You know, I think a lot of churches worldwide frown on you killing the head of the faith mm, yeah it's not it's not uh not their favorite thing so it does seem to be a big part of the expansion of the story is saying okay george is like i i gave myself this option time to use it time to use these kettle blacks and and get really deep into it but why is osmond in quotes in that in that note like why why uh, osmond betrays her is it like not Actually, Osmond, or, do or you think it's because it's like really Littlefinger's betrayal, you know? Uh, oh, like I like that like, idea. Like, hmm. yeah. It's not actually Little Osmond, but Littlefinger. He didn't decide to do it; his employer decided. I like that. That that could fit. That could fit. Or I like it. This Cersei doesn't even know their names, right? She says <laughs> yeah. Osmond. He's like, I'm Oswald. And George forgets too. He's like, well, let's say it, maybe Osmond. Maybe it'll be Osni or Osfried. But let's just he could just write Oz. <laughs> Oz <laughs> betrays Oz Dash. One of them. <laughs> what about Queen asked me to say that? I kind of see why that might be related to the murder of the previous High Septon. Because what happens is... He goes to confess. Osney. No, Osfried. Osfried goes to confess and the High Septon is like... I've never seen someone so eager to confess a horrible crime that's going to get them punished severely. So they tortured him more to find out what the real story was. And that's when Cersei's lies come out. And then they trap her with that because they don't tell her, right? They don't tell her that he's confessed and they bring her into his presence and then capture her when she's there, uh, confronted with the lies directly. So as things stand now, Osmond and Oz, no, I got to get it wrong. Osney is the one who was tortured. See, it's so hard. Osmond and Osfried are in the dungeon by Kevin's direction, whereas Osney is imprisoned by the faith. So all three of them are imprisoned, but they're not all imprisoned in the same place. Two are in one place, one in another. It's the one who was in the King's Guard. Osmond is the one that's said to betray Cersei in these notes. And what's going to happen, according to Kevin, remember, is. Uh, they're, if they confess, they go to the wall. If they don't, they have to fight the mountain, the undead mountain. Now, is this still going to be the case after Kevin's death? Yeah, probably. Cause I don't see why Mace Tyrell would want to change that. Like I don't, he doesn't like the kettle blacks. In fact, one of the kettle blacks accused his daughter of fornication. And that might be where the queen told me to say that line comes from where it's under torture. He's like, the queen told me to say that I that that I slept with Marjorie because he didn't sleep with Marjorie, but that was the idea to get her to bring her down under charges of treason, which the queen sleeping around is high treason, as she should very well know because she's committed that crime herself several times with several different people. So, yeah, uh, thus. But if we take this all back, let's unpack, like repack this rather than unpacking it. We say. Okay, so if Cersei's chapters were added, like a lot of, very little of this was actually going to happen, or maybe it was just going to, a smaller version of this was going to be happen, or a less detailed version of this was going to happen, then 
the kettle black stuff you can see added on it just is a, a way to increase this or to make her make her more like Ares and more like Magor to do a lot of the things they did like fighting the faith or the wildfire stuff just per, just calling to mind a lot of the worst Targaryens <laughs> with her actions but the stuff with Gregor is where I get a little caught up because she ends it all with having Gregor at her side. You know, Gregor carries her when she finishes her walk of shame. And then from that point on, he's basically her thug in the Red Keep that no one's going to want to challenge her because she's he's by her side. Now, that's what that's mostly what's portrayed in the show. We're, we're kind of guessing that will also happen in the books because it seems like the kind of thing Cersei would do. It's, I'm not we're not guessing it because the show did it, but because it just makes so much sense. And it's what she's kind of always wanted. She's always, she always wanted Jamie to be like what Gregor is now, like a, a mindless brute that will kill anyone who upsets her or threaten or intimidate anyone who upsets her. That will not say no to her because he got to deal with this guy. That's what she wanted Jamie to kind of be. She wanted to, he want, she wanted him to have her back to, to rule beside her, but, but a step down beside, but one step lower <laughs> still, she wanted to be in charge, but you know, that's Cersei for you. So, but the uh, the undead part of this, like Kyburn, is this Kyburn stuff an add on too? Like, if that was invented as part of the Cersei plot, well, I don't think it was fully invented for the Cersei plot because remember, way back in a Game of Thrones, Bran has that vision of the the helm full of black blood, and it's Sir Gregor's helm, right? So it's it really feels like the undead Gregor thing has been a plan for a very long time. Now, maybe the, the black blood thing doesn't indicate undead because the black blood is Oberyn poisoning him. That's why the, that's where he had, that's what turned his blood that color. So it's not directly what made him undead. It's just what was pivoted to after it was realized, well, we're not saving this guy. This dude, he's poisoned. I'll try to turn him into an undead monster then. Hmm, let's do that. That's the next best thing, right? Yeah, right. So what I'm left with or what we're left with is perhaps... George just changing the timeline on that. Him saying, all right, well, I was going to do this undead Gregor thing later. Let's do it a little sooner. It's not a big deal to move that up. It's not like he's going to age out. He's undead. <laughs> he can just hang out with Cersei and be her intimidator. Her, her, the, the reason that she gets her way in so many things. The reason no one wants to say no to her. Uh, it fits in very well with her yes men court, her yes men council. Not only are they afraid of her in the first place, they're really afraid of her with this guy by her side. Now, there is more Cersei business in this, in these notes, <clears throat> aka in this episode, because there is some Dorn stuff here that we're going to get to shortly, and it refers to Gregor's skull, or lack thereof. So the skull business, the maybe switching of the heads, which has been a long time deep fandom topic of discussion, is absolutely referenced here, but it's referenced in the Dorn notes, not the Cersei notes, so we'll come back to that. Steve Van Prien points out glass candles allow for instant communication between Bravos and Westeros, which could allow for orders to be made and carried out quickly. Huh, okay. Yeah, just as a way for the faceless men to communicate. Yeah, that's actually a very good point because we've all, we've wondered how Jaken, like the being known as Jaken, that's probably not his real name, Jaken. <laughs> we call, I like to call him Jaken because our cat is called Jaken. But yeah, how do they like communicate how does he know what his next mission is does he go all the way back to bravos because he go remember he pivots from hanging out with aria to changing into the face that we end up seeing at old town the one that the alchemist takes the one that pate sees it's the same description we assume that he also went to the iron islands and killed bale and Greyjoy at euron's behest where did he get his orders from like who came to communicate with him who you know what i mean so Glass candles might be able to explain something like that. Now, there are other means, but this would certainly cover that very simply. So our roommate here, we have a, a roommate that, that we live with who's a great guy. I've known him for a long time. His name is Jimmy. Jimmy Hendricks. No kidding. His na actual name is Jimmy Hendricks. Of all of us, he has really responded to the Magic Mind beverage the most and I think it's partly because of his routine. He gets up really early, has a very full day, and works really hard. He's a very high effort individual, has a lot of different things going at all times, and it's one of those people that doesn't doesn't sit still very well. 
And he is a big fan of Magic Mind. It is working for him, getting him going in the morning, helping his, he says his thoughts are a little more clear, maybe keeps him active a little bit longer than he would have otherwise. And that means a lot because it's hard to be more active than an extremely active person. Like some people, the, the, you push yourself so hard, it's hard to squeeze more out of that. But according to him, Magic Mind is getting him there. And that tracks with my experience. I'm not a... 120% effort guy all the time like he is. I wouldn't call myself a type A person, but... Despite your name starting with A. Yeah, despite all my all the A's in my name. I got a lot of A's. Beginning... You have to type middle. A a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I, I type A a lot. You're right. <laughs> I'm not type A, but I type A. And yeah, it's been working for me too. Magic Mind, it tastes good. I know you're a particular fan of the flavor. Yeah, yeah, I think it tastes delicious, actually. I think, yeah. I mean, I also mix it with like a juice that I think it complements it very well, but I think it would complement a lot of drinks well. And yeah. I know people who drink it plain. I dr I've drank it plain. I drink it with water. My favorite is to drink it with cold water, but I've, I like your method too of drinking it with juice. I've tried that a few times. And yeah, which is just goes to show it mixes well with a lot of different things. It's just the size of a shot. So it's easy to combine with something else or just to drink it just like that. Now, this January, Magic Mind is helping you gear up to crush your 2024 New Year resolutions. It started on the right foot. You know, it's, 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 once you have a habit that's going, it's easier to keep it, but that initial startup can be the problem. So maybe a boost would help you with that, getting going. So with one month for free, if you subscribe for three months, that's already one third off. If you go to magicmind.com slash Jan Westeros, that's Jan like January. But if you add in the code Westeros20, it's another 20% off, which is effectively like 75% off. Westeros20 is good anytime you use it, but this one month free offer is only good in January 2024. So sign up now. That's magicmind.com slash Jan Westeros and start thinking more clearly and having more activity in your day. And I'd love for you to comment and let us know what you think when you get it. If you if you like the taste too, like me, or find it effective. I'd just like to hear from y'all. Yeah, same here. I'm curious because, you know, everybody's body chemistry is different. Everybody will react to it differently. And that's part of why I use Jimmy as an example because for him, it, it's, it's working for all of us. But for him, he's, you know, the most that it's uh, having the biggest effect on. Also want to shout out uh, a fun event we're doing in mostly February, but it's going to start at the, at the uh, end of January here in 2024. And probably every year going forward, we're going to do something similar to this. So if you're hearing this in a, in a year other than 2023-24, you're still going to want to uh, hear what I have to say because it's going to be relevant in future years, which is the topics moot. We're going to choose 12 episode topics in a span of four weeks, three per week. And that will be done by polls. So if you are a patron, if you have signed up to be a supporter on patreon.com slash history of Westeros, you can participate. No matter what level you're signed up at, you get a vote. Higher levels will have more votes. And yeah, we're going to be picking a lot of topics that's going to help get us through most of the year, not all of the year. But that's a lot of topics. Remember that a lot of the year will be taken up by House of the Dragon. Yeah, good chunk of that. As well. um, and then some more... Valar reread us for Fire and Blood. So we've got several things planned already, plus some topics that we want to do uh, regardless of polls and other things. So between all that, we're going to set the stage for a lot of 2024, and then we'll do the same thing early 2024 for 2025, et cetera, and going forward. So this is the first time we're really doing that, but we expect it to be a thing going forward. So I'm excited to talk about it here the first time. So yeah, sign up to be a patron and participate in what topics we're going to be making the rest of the year. It's it's a lot of fun. You get to have a say. You get to join the discussion and uh, see what kind of things we're planning because, you know, your, some of your favorite topics might be in there and you want to make sure they get represented. Let's talk about Dorn. Dorn indeed. And it noted, notice it's called Dorn, whereas these other notes refer to specific characters. And this is... Pretty simply, I think, because he hadn't decided which POVs yet. He hadn't settled on who would actually get the chapters. And he never did settle on one character. He never even settled on two. <laughs> he settled on three. It quickly was whittled down to two because Aris Okart only had one chapter. And then he died later in the book. But Ario Hota has one. 
And then another in A Dance with Dragons, and Ariane Martell has two. So he did have to split it up a bit, kind of like how he did the Iron Islands, which we'll also, of course, be talking about in this episode. The note is, Balon v. Aris, end with blood and fire, mountain missing teeth. So, he didn't give us Balon versus Aris, but there are other notes from the Cushing Library uh treasure trove that indicate that was the plan and it's not that big of a change really if you think about it aris was won over by arianne and he committed suicide by hota but it, it changed it just a little bit and he and arianne have made their play balon is sent south and comes to confront them and they end up having a fight or even maybe they don't even make their play balon comes south to collect uh marcella because reasons and and that's when they reveal that they're not going to give her back and aris and balon have to fight over it i don't know who was going to win that probably balon but maybe not maybe aris kills balon and then uh, other things happen i don't know what the plan would have been from that point but you can kind of see how it throws dorn into chaos it would have um deepened the rift between dorn and the Lannisters that was slowly being maybe healed. Um, because as it stands, remember what happens is Balin is put in the very uncomfortable position of having to go there and lie to them and to lead them into an ambush to kill Tristane and, br and bring Marcella back and blame it on Tyrion. <laughs> so, and, and Cersei didn't choose her agent very well. Balin threw all via what we learned about him before is a decent guy a good knight in in this in all sense of the word a good fighter and a, a pretty good person and so you don't really send a good guy to do dirty deeds <laughs> you know she should have sent like Marin trant or something but maybe he's even less trustworthy even though he's more evil by by a mile anyway this is probably around the time he added on Dark Star and High Hermitage because it was a necessity in part because of the changing of this Balon and Aris plot and in part because of the five-year gap making Edric Dane too young or leaving Edric Dane too young. This is something we've come back to several times. Edric Dane was so set up to be a sword of the morning. I mean, the way he comes off to Arya as just strong, young, brave, honorable, humble, just all these qualities that you associate with sword of the morning and but that was changed like an unfortunate change of the 12 of the five-year gap is that this kid is 12 years old it just doesn't really work that well for him to wield dawn or to be the sword of the morning or any of that so that's where gerald dane comes from and most likely like there wasn't even a high hermitage this cadet branch of of the danes isn't on the map or anything like that pretty likely that george retrofitted it to the story <clears throat> it works it's not like we needed to know who dark star was Dorn wasn't a focus, so having him not be mentioned is meaningless to me. I don't think he, there's no reason to think he would have been mentioned. I mean, there's reasons to think he might have been, but the fact that he wasn't is, doesn't, it's not a problem. It, 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 this worked for me. Now, remember too, going back to Balon versus Aris. Yeah, it turned into Aris versus Ario. But Ario Hotas still thinks about the possibility of fighting Balon himself. And I'm not sure it comes off like foreshadowing, but it, definitely suggest the possibility because Ario thinks about fighting Ares <laughs> and that does happen and now he fights and he thinks about fighting Balon so it might happen too but as things stand they're on the same team Ario Hota and Balon Swan are sent together along with Obar Sand to go quote beard Darkstar in his den uh, sent by Doran Martell so who knows what's going to happen there but it doesn't really seem like they're set up to be against each other I mean, yeah, uh, but things could change. You know, a lot of things could change and that the way things change could end up sh putting them on opposite sides. It's not like they have personal loyalty to each other. <laughs> it just, they're currently on the same team. This also might give us some clarity on the Cersei stuff, the Kyborg and the, the use of Gregor's skull. Kind of like how he wanted to, he seems to write things and then decide, maybe I want to make be a little sneakier about this. I want to make this a little more obscure. 
Perfect example came earlier in this episode when we were talking about the key being stolen, where it was first, it was a book, then it was a glass candle, where by making it a key, it's a lot easier to conceal what the true target is and to leave it open if George wants to add or change it. Very similar here because the deception of the mountain skull. Let's unpack what happens here. Remember, the skull is sent down to Dorne. They have a big ceremony, a big dinner where Doran announces to everybody, oh, maybe this is the start of peace now. Now, he doesn't believe that. He says it because people are listening and it's going to get back to Cersei. But in, in his, but in reality, he already knows about the plan to murder his son, that Cersei's plan to do that. So he's, he's just putting on a, a brave play along face. Uh, but then later they talk about the skull and they're like, is this Gregor's skull? Like, I don't know. It doesn't, it's kind of weird looking. And they're like, well, what would they accomplish by not giving us the real skull? Gregor is almost eight feet tall. Well, if he's not dead, we're going to find out. Yeah, they are going to find out because he is dead, but he's walking around. So I don't exactly know what they'll find out, but it's going to be interesting. <laughs> Either way, this seems to conceal it a little more, right? If you, the original plan was to have missing teeth in the skull, which would make it obvious to both the reader and the Dornish to the Sand Snakes and perhaps Doran Martell as well, that it's not the same person. Like this, this skull has missing teeth. The mountain didn't have missing teeth, did he? It would raise the question. The reader would thus be alerted to the mystery and would be like, I don't remember Gregor ever having his teeth described as, as missing. And yeah, well, what's going on there? So it, it's a different way to bring the, the mystery up and to highlight it. Though I'm honestly not sure that much has changed by doing it this way. Because they're they're going to find out. They're just going to find out a little later. And it still leaves us with the question of, of why. Why did they send a fake skull? Probably just the simplest answer is that the spell wouldn't work if he cut the skull off, the head off. Just replacing, sewing a different person's head on. It just doesn't work. I, don't, I mean, who knows how necromancy works? <laughs> There's a lot of fog for the plot to hide behind because we're no one's like hey that's nonsense necromancy doesn't work like that you can't cut the head off of yeah like we're all experts on necromancy so we're gonna call george out for that yeah i don't think so <laughs> we don't we don't know what the deal is with that <laughs> i have no idea so yeah mm, interesting to see that was such an important thing though out of all the notes to do with dorn and the missing skull and blood and fire and and who to give POVs to. It's interesting that the missing teeth is so important. It's the thing that's was George intended to be a clue for them, but then he changed it to, well, they're gonna figure it out when they get to King's Landing. What about that last note or the set the middle note? Remember the notes are Balin V Aris, end with blood and fire, and mountain missing teeth. End with blood and fire is pretty much what happened. Technically, he says fire and blood, I think, but when he reveals the plan to Arianne at the end of A Feast for Crows after her failed plan and after she's been in prison for a while and after he finally tells her the deal. So it that stayed. That is how A Feast for Crows, the Dornish chapters end with that. So that's one of the very few that ends the way that George intended. Uh, so that's kind of neat. It, it evolved. It, it was a added on plot, but he ha clearly had ideas for it for a while and it mostly went that way. Let's talk about John. John, one of the most exciting ones. Good, other, obviously a character who's not in A Feast for Crows at all, uh, but is big in A Dance with Dragons. Several quotes here. Quote, yes, we're going to lose. Quote, I can get us the armor. Not quote, just a line without quotes around it. I can stay and look brave and you all die. Quote, Val carries a message. And then not quote, rattle shirt goes with. And then page three, separate page. End with hard home. Yeah. Well, okay. Lots of fatalistic resigned vibes there, it seems. Right? Like he just doesn't say, yes, we're going to lose. I can stay and look and bra look brave and you all die. E. End with hard home. Of course, that's not a specific note, but. Which rattle shirt? <laughs> However, <laughs> which rattle shirt are we talking about here? Mance? Or actual rattle shirt? That was a question I raised earlier when we were talking about uh, the, the wedding, the, the northern wedding and Davos's plot. Which rattle shirt are we talking? Is Mance, 
is that Mance or is that someone else? Yeah. So this is confusing given that the name doesn't actually tell us which character it's referring to. It, it narrows it down to two, Rattleshirt or actual Mance, but that's a big difference which one it is because Rattleshirt isn't dead it, uh, at that point. Uh, isn't dead until the beginning of A Dance of Dragons. Maybe he was going to die at the beginning of A Feast for Crows when John was going to have chapters in there, when, you know, the, the burning of Mance Rattleshirt was probably a plan for a while, but maybe not. The bit about Val carries a message? Well, yeah. That happened. Val was sent to carry a message to Tormund. However, the whole Rattleshirt goes with note is... Goes with who? Goes with Val? Interesting. Because if that's Val, if it's Rattleshirt goes with Val to carry a message, what if that's Man? What if the original plan was for Mance to sneak off with Val in disguise as Rattleshirt? Probably not, though, because why would a Melisandre allow that? The whole business with Mance being alive is that it was engineered by Melisandre and perhaps with Stannis' knowledge. Eileen, yes, but it's not a sure thing. And that they then send him to do these other things. Why would they consent to send Mance north with Val uh, away from everybody when he could just be free and and do his own thing? But but if he's somewhat trapped by the glamour, if he's sort of... Mel Melisandre can kind of control him a bit, then maybe that's not a fear. Uh, on the, but still, the problem is that John sends them north. Not... Whereas... The mat, the rattle shirt thing, is something that they convince John to do, right? They get John. They're like, "Look, let, let me let me go save your sister." And he's like, "Why would I want rattle shirt saving my sister? Are you kidding me? This guy's likely to like abuse her and, and as much as he is to rescue her." And they're like, "Actually, this isn't rattle shirt." <laughs> and you're like, "Oh." So maybe that was also. So I can see how that was wrapped into recruiting Tormund. Like, if you want to really make sure you get Tormund, send your send another person with. I don't know why Rattleshirt would help with that, though. But I do know why Mance would help with that. So, mm, yeah, that might have been the play. Send Mance Raider North, you know, uh, in disguise. So that way other people don't know that you're letting Mance Raider go. Because that would look bad to the rest of the Night's Watch, to even to the rest of Stannis' men. Like, what is he... How is he letting the king beyond the wall go? Like, yeah, you can't just do that. That's that's weird. Uh, yes, we're going to lose. Who is that referred to? Who are they? Who is he saying? Yes, we're going to lose to. And who is even the speaker here? I don't know who the speaker is. It, it could be John, but it could be like it could be Mance. It could be like yeah, we've lost or but Mance doesn't ever really give up hope though. Uh, but maybe the, maybe the plan was that he was kind of fatalistic about it when he was imprisoned that's tough the line i can get us the armor really throws us who is us need to suggest maybe it relates to stannis demanding armor and from the watch and john standing firm like no you can't have our stuff that goes against the night's watch vows you're already pressing us by being here in the first place and all that so i can't bend any farther the problem with that is I can get us the armor. Who says that? Like if that phrase doesn't fit with this concept super well, because what, who's he talking to? Is he saying I can get us the armor after I've given ours to Stannis? Is Stannis saying that to someone else? And then John turns him down. I, I'm not, yeah, it doesn't, uh, the way it's worded makes it hard to fit into a scenario like that, but I wouldn't close the door on it. Another possibility is it relates to Rattleshirt's armor. Remember, Mance talks about how he doesn't like wearing Rattleshirt's clackety armor. The clacking is like to drive him insane, he says. But then Mel's like, but it really helps sell the glamour. So if you really wanted to be sure that this glamour was going to work, if John was maybe in on it earlier, he's like, hey, we need this armor to make the glamour work. We got to go acquire it. How are we going to get it? Where is Rattleshirt's armor? But would it really be hard to acquire? They captured the guy. He was their cap. Like he was in their jail. Like just take it, you know. <laughs> this doesn't. So this one, this one really throws me. I'm, I'm really not sure what I can get us the armor means. I uh, would love to hear ideas from you all, but I don't land on anything where I'm like, yeah, that, that feels like it's got to be it. Just a couple of vague ideas that maybe work. 
So I don't think it is this, but I am reminded of the stuff with John Valerian steel armor. Yeah. I just the... don't think that this is that. I just think we'd be remiss to not at least mention that. Yeah, offhand. he does. There's the vision of him in the, the black armor, yeah, and I think sword that's of red. Just and... a coincidence. I don't think yeah. that was in his mind at this point. Probably not because he says us. Yeah, us. Yeah, yeah us, yeah, the don't... armor. Yeah. It sounds like multiple sets of armor. Yeah. But. Or unless it's the man's, unless it's the rattle shirt, because then that's the specific set that they need for their plan. So I can get us the armor for this plan. Yeah. So, mm, yep. Uh, but that's the problem with deciphering notes. <laughs> They're not meant to definite give us definitive answers in the first place. <clears throat> I can stay and look brave, and you all die. I I don't know what that means, but I think that's related to Hard Home. I think that means that he's like, look, I should go to Hard Home. I need to be at the front. I need to help lead this directly this is too important of a thing to leave to subordinates which he ends up doing <laughs> but if the original plan was for him to go which it seems to be here and it says end with hard home okay so first of all it doesn't end with hard home it, uh, hard home is he get john gets news about hard home one chapter before he gets stabbed so it's pretty close to end with hard home but not quite uh had he been there it probably would have ended there because the, you know, they send the letter and it, it did end kind of for them at that point. But then, you know, from John's point of view, there's one more chapter, which resulted in him getting stabbed. So he might be arguing with, I don't know, some of the free folk or with his other Night's Watch subordinates, people like uh, Dolorous Ed or Bowen Marsh about the wisdom of going to hard home i almost feel like he's talking to the free folk though someone someone talking to val or something like that i should go to hard home staying here it look maybe it looks brave but you're just all gonna die and you all meaning you all you free folk because who else would die who else is you all would die like i can stay and you all die if john says that phrase you all the Night's Watch? No, he doesn't. I don't think he would separate himself from the Night's Watch. Stannis? The Stannis is men are marching south. Like, what is that? It doesn't make sense either. So really all I can think of is the free folks. I think it, it relates to him deciding that it's important for him to go to free to hard home to save the free folk so that they, and, and partly out of, you know, empathy, but partly because they'll become the undead and become enemies of a worse sort. So I think that's what that relates to, but it's it's tricky. Um, when would John have died? Think about that. If the plan was to end at hard home, then there's no stabbing in this book. It doesn't mean it won't happen. And there's a lot of evidence that George has planned for John's death since book one. So that I don't, I'm not too worried about that. I'm not concerned that he added that later, but if George has been planning on having John die and come back since the beginning, well, it's a big moment and he's going to place it properly. He, Question. I just have a question. Yeah. Is it at all possible for this to have happened at Hardhome? Like, do you think that his betrayal and death could have happened at Hardhome? Yes. Okay. I think it's possible. Now, he wouldn't have been able to. Now, the main reason they seem to stab him to death is him saying he's going to lead an army to fight the Boltons. Yeah, he could have said that at hard. He could have said any number of incendiary things, I would think, at hard yeah, home. Yeah, it would have had to be a different thing. I don't think yeah. it could have been that. Like, how's he going to get the pink letter yeah. at hard home? You know, it doesn't really make sense. But but yes, he could have. They could have. He could have gotten the pink letter, announced his intent to do that after he gets back from hard home. They stab him at hard home before yeah. he can get back. Yeah. Something like that. That definitely fits or could fit. And another way it fits, interestingly, is the original... 1993 outline called for Catelyn to die beyond the wall and get raised there instead of in the Riverlands. So this kind of maybe fits with that instead, instead of Catelyn dying beyond the wall, since she clearly, that plan was changed a while before, clearly at the end of Storm of Swords that was changed. Uh, maybe he thought that would work for John instead. Uh, instead, of course, John dies one chapter later without having gone to hard home and getting news of it instead. So I guess the plan would have been if he had, if he either did die at hard or didn't die at hard home, which I like that theory by Shea there. But if that wasn't the idea, then he would have just died and been raised all within the confines of the Winds of Winter, which that seems fine too. But it works so well as a climactic moment to be like, oh wow, what happened? Because I know, like, 
in some ways it's not like, well, he's not dead, dead. We, you know, he's dead in terms of he will have died, but he's not dead as a character. And that worked real well as a cliffhanger in the TV show because people were actually like, well, yeah, he might be dead, dead. Like that is how Hollywood kills off characters, right? At the end of the season, you know, their contract is up. It fits. In the book, a lot of people are like, ah, he's not dead. They're just, you know, it's too much foreshadowing for it. But George went with it anyway. He's like, yeah, no, I think enough readers will be, it still leaves a lot of things in an interesting spot. It's still very unpredictable what's going to happen next. Even if you think he's coming back, there's still the question of how and what he's going to be like and what's going to happen in the interim. So still about the journey, not the uh, destination in that case. So I guess maybe George pivoted to that because he's like, you know, this still works really well. Or it, or Shea was just right. And the idea was for him to die at Hardhome and it's still an amazing climax just in a different place uh, with with some different Cause my, my other question, circumstances. My other question is is whether his death has to be a betra- because of betrayal. Ooh. Like, like, can't he, like, is the is the important part that John died or is the important part that he's betrayed? I, I don't know. Great point, actually, Shea, because... All the foreshadowing for John's death, I don't think the foreshadowing involves betrayal. It's just him being dead. Like, yeah. armored in black ice, you know, warmth seeping out of his body yeah. from Bran's dream in, in book one. <clears throat> None of those imply a, a betrayal, just a death. Very good point. I like that a lot. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, maybe he just dies. He just gets killed. It's just bad stuff happens and he's dead. <laughs> maybe he was going to get raised by the magic of the others instead yeah. of, like, in a... In a um. After that, you bring it up because that's why we we brought that up about Catelyn. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so he maybe he still has some of his own <clears throat> thoughts or whatever. He's not completely under their control. Maybe this just a, would have been a way to show what was happening there. Maybe that's uh, some of that was ported over to Varamir's prologue instead. You know, mm-hmm. like well, some of that process of just before death and yeah, being captured and yeah. I could see that. I, I kind of doubt Varamir was the plan for the prologue of A Dance with Dragons a long time prior. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, that's, that's kind of obscure. Uh, but it worked really well. Hmm. So that's pretty cool. I like that a lot. Um, this John one is one of the most interesting ones, I think. Uh, although it maybe isn't one of the most different. You know, like some of these things, you're just changing the where some of these things happen. It's like, you know what? It's, it's more meaningful for him to be betrayed than just die in battle or to die facing his enemies, you know? that I mean, because that would be cool. He goes to a hard home and has a f- big battle, not like the TV show, but something epic and, and overwhelming like that just, just shows the, the readers and the Night's Watch just what they're facing. And then it'd be pretty terrible to, to realize that's what they're up against and then have John fall to that or to have them stab him. It, like, what a dumb thing to do. What a tragically horrible mistake for the night's watch to murder their lord commander right when things get uh, the most dangerous or right when they have a, a need for strong leadership the most so yeah that works let's talk about sansa 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 the first note on sansa is divide chapter what does that mean Littlefinger quote cersei has overreached she'll soon be done that one's pretty familiar we pretty pretty much get that one already then page three, so a second set of notes, not directly connected to these. Question mark old, resolve to be SS, question mark Sansa Stark, and take north. That's pretty familiar. One, tourney of wing tonight. Two, sweet, Wob- sweet Robin woos or weds. It's not clear which George wrote there. This is an example where the people who transcribed this did their best, but it's just unclear whether he wrote the word woos or the word weds or maybe even something else uh next number point number three is news from wh which we assume is white harbor and then fourth is kill the mouse and then the number four which indicates the number of planned chapters like it does in some other spots this one remained fairly stable this one has changed perhaps the least of some of these others, but it's definitely changed some. One being the news from White Harbor. There is no news from White Harbor during the Elaine chapter with the turning of the Winged Knights, the most recent Elaine chapter, the Winds of Winter chapter. So, which means, of course, the turning doesn't happen. They're setting up for the turning. And we pointed that out at the time. We pointed out it's interesting that White Harbor, uh, there's no news from the North in this chapter. It's, it's kind of some of the news, uh, some of the things that have happened, they haven't heard about yet. I don't think they heard about the fall of Dragonstone for example. Um, well, I'd be curious, like, when the tourney happens, if that's where we see this news of oh, White Harbor. Yeah. Like, the tourney, like, as you just, you just said, we haven't seen the tourney. So perhaps there is 
where that's where she learns the news or because she's exposed to a whole lot of other people so she would have a chance to hear that news that maybe has been kept for her from her perhaps even yeah and it's just a, a place that information would be disseminated so i think it makes sense still i that's mean it could true. still happen afterwards i don't know that it's like news from white harbor has arrived and it's a big deal it might just be that she talks to enough other people that she hears news she from hears white, that yeah. news from white harbor that maybe hasn't made the rounds in the veil yet yeah and it would make sense that all the visitors coming from a, from yeah. around the Vale that they would have different they would have heard different things and yeah there's a lot of go- I mean that's part of one of the things we see in the first chapter of setting up for the tournament is Sansa hears gossip talks to people and learns things yeah it's just so many lords and ladies around and yeah what would the news be though could it be the news that Lord Wyman has bent the knee to Tywin and uh, to Tommen and gotten his heir back if so that relates to the fake out the da- the fake Davos execution they mount the head and hands of someone meant to look like Davos on their walls and people believe it. So, and that all co- comes together. Basically the announcing of the bending of the knee and the receiving of, of Willis back and the uh, ex- faking execution of Davos all happened pretty close together. So you would think that quite possibly all that news arrives at the same time. However, Nina writes an um, even more exciting possibility here that Davos is charged with getting Rickon back to Lord Wyman. So what if we have that happen? What if Davos rescues Rickon and that news reaches it? Or if we're going back to the original notes that we looked at, what if Davos, the plan was for Davos to get away with fake Arya somehow and then deliver, and then that news reaches uh, the veil that Arya even though it's not Arya, has, is in the Vale and then, or is, is in the North and has married Ruth Bol- or R- Ramsey Bolton. Like Sansa would be, she'd have a reaction to that. I don't know exactly what it would be, but it would be whoa, you know, of finding out that her sister is alive, finding out that she's married to Ramsey Bolton. Like that's a lot of stuff. And but there's another possibility that uh, Davos gets the real Arya back. Right, we talked. Uh, we maybe should have talked about this during the Davos chapter stuff, but better here than than never. Remember the our our theory for Arya returning to Westeros. A popular theory is that she connects with Justin Massey sometimes somehow. Justin Massey's been sent there, so if she could come back with him in some capacity, and then uh, especially if Jane Poole ends up there, you know, because they is she is being sent to the Wall and. That could uh, trigger any amount of any types of news that could get to Sansa that she would react to or finding out about uh, any Stark returning to the North might accelerate her own timetable or Littlefinger's timetable, right? He might be the one more concerned that she might lose to the nor- North to one of her siblings that they both thought weren't even around him. He was like, oh, well, I thought your path to the North was pretty wide open, but turns out you have siblings alive that we thought were dead. So we might want to do that quicker and that's where we move things along from the news from white harbor to kill the mouse which is probably sir shadrick which is interesting that sir shadrick is actually so important here we we knew he would matter that he was looking for sansa he knows who she is and he might try to kidnap her or out her in some way uh my favorite theory it's nina's as well that he fails in this attempt to steal her, but in the process does out her prior to the plan to out her. Like Littlefinger wants to out her, but he, he's arranging it at this very specific time so that he can win the hearts and minds of so many young nobles who will fight to restore Sansa to her rightful seat in the North. He wants to win them over like that. So the Mad Mouse could throw that plan off a bit by revealing her true identity before the opportune moment comes before and like, Oh, look, she's been here in hiding. And then it won't look, it'll look like Littlefinger trying to conceal her and keep her for himself or something else instead of the way that it will be, would have been delivered. And like, I've been keeping her secret to protect her. And now's the time to make things right. But if it's outed ahead of that time, he doesn't get to point out his 
to lie about his good guy angle here. <laughs> that he's he's one of the good guys. He's been helping her and keeping her from her enemies at his own personal risk. But if the Mad Mouse outs her, that it doesn't look that way. It just looks like he's been keeping her secret, hiding her and, and concealing her for his own needs, which is which is the truth. <laughs> uh, so this finding out that her siblings are alive or that someone's trying to steal the North, any number of these things or all these things and collect uh, as a collective batch could make her more motivated to go North and, and make her claim. Uh, even if that's also what Littlefinger wants, she might actually decide she wants it too, which gets the gears spinning on eventually breaking free of him, you know, slaying the giant in a castle of snow, so to speak. Now, the bit about Sweet Robin woos slash or weds. Yeah, see, that's tricky because maybe the original plan was to have her wed him and that way bring the veil on their side through marriage. Because I'm really, i not so sure George's plan was Harry the heir back before the five-year gap. I'm pretty sure Harry the heir and this whole distant Aaron cousin marriage thing is an, is an invention of the five-year gap. I, I kind of doubt that was how George conceived it in the beginning because it seems a little, it, it's just a little obscure, right? It, it's cool. I like it. I love how it's delivered. It's the climax of A Feast for Crows. And look, you, this is how you're going to take the North back. Like he, him delivering his plan on how you're going to be the new lady of the North, the new lady of Winterfell. We're going to, we're going to take you back there. Uh, it could have worked with her married to Sweet Robin, but doesn't seem like the way it's heading that way. Now, instead, the, the murder of Sweet Robin is, is apparently going to be more likely to be what happens, which, yeah, that might not have been the original plan. I'm, I'm not sure that, that George had planned on Littlefinger killing him off so soon because the whole bit about Sweet Sleep and the dosing of him. I'd have to double check on that, but I'm pretty sure that doesn't start till a feast for crows. I don't sure there's any. I don't think there's any mention of that in a storm of swords. So uh, yeah, there, there's no actual suggestion of that until until then. So wow, so that's tricky. I mean, it revolves what's kind of basic in terms of yes, somehow Sansa is going to leave the Vale for the North and embark on a quest to help retake Winterfell or take it without help one way or the other either help someone else or be helped to do it doubt she'll do it alone um but it's wrapped up in all this what's going on with Arya? what's going on with jane pool masquerading as Arya? what's going on with stannis and the boltons what's going on with john what's going on with rickon and davos what's going on with well whoever else i didn't name theon asha you know <laughs> all these other characters it's it's tricky but uh, this is part of why this sort of information is valuable to us because it helps show where George was, uh, shows us what George thought was important, or at least might have been important, or at least might have been key moments, if not the most important things that he thought were pivotal, things that he thought were, were memorable, things that he thought were, uh, we had to get to within the story in order to get farther. Um, the, the old note, when it suggests, uh, Resolved to be Sansa Stark? What does that mean? Uh, that could have been a note from prior to the five-year gap. Like, it sounds like he's saying that she's gotten older, and it would be a lot bigger of a deal for Sansa to regain her Sansa identity as Elaine if she'd been Elaine for five years, right? That's a big difference. It's, you've been masquerading as someone for that long, it's more of a transition. There's more conflict in becoming your old self. There's more of your old self you have to rediscover and it won't be as natural because you've been you've been practicing this facade for so long. So it would it would be a really interesting like pathos for Santa I mean, to kind of have to undo all that. To be honest, it's be even if you didn't have some fake self, imagine try at like whatever 18 years old trying to recapture what you were like at 13 it's, wow yeah it's yeah it's like very hard whether you had a secret identity or not frankly like i can't conceive of of being the same person i was and think of she just think back because that's a lot of hair dye i've used in years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> that would be a way for maybe to find out the truth somehow it's like some servant stumbles on that like how do they doing it herself without any help <laughs> So, 
Now, one ma- last bit about the Mad Mouse. Sansa, uh, Sansa, hmm, not Sansa, Nina <laughs> has felt for a while that Shadrick is not a critical character in his own right, but rather a plot dynamic to move Sansa's story forward. She also tends to think that what will hasten Sansa's revelation as Sansa, as opposed to Elaine Stone, is Shadrick also is a vehicle for Sansa to find out that she's not as hidden as she thinks she is. Varys is the one that told the Mad Mouse and others to look for her. So her finding out that actually people are hunting for me might also accelerate her timeline. She's like, uh, it's only a matter of time before someone, someone else comes along and points this out. Or now that it's out, other people are going to start coming for me. Now, now that one person has revealed my identity, I have to assume that other people know and that they're going to make attempts to steal me away, if not kill me. And that means getting a move on with this plan to get back north, where if she's just, if she reveals her own identity, then it's, there's no outing her. <laughs> she's outed herself. So if she does it on her own terms, on her own timeline, uh, then it, it's just like this. It's like this Littlefinger doesn't want someone else revealing Sansa's identity. He wants to do it at a very precise moment that brings him the most advantage. Sansa's in a similar spot personally, even though she doesn't want the things Littlefinger wants. Well, not all of them. She wants some of them. She wants herself back in Winterfell. She likes that idea. She just doesn't want to owe him so much for it. <laughs> but finding out that Varys has got a ransom on her, like, woo, that's that's scary. I mean, she knows Varys. She's been around him. She's like her father. He gives her the creeps. And there's a good reason for that. He's creepy and capable and totally willing to do awful things, despite his friendly demeanor. <laughs> Let's talk about Sansa's sister, Arya. The first line on the notes is, end with her first gift, then joy of giving, and then mercy at the gate. And mercy at the gate is crossed out. And the number four, indicating four chapters. Now, the note four, that actually came out pretty well. That's actually really close. Unlike most of the other main POVs, Arya wasn't pushed entirely to Dance with Dragons or A Feast for Crows. Rather, she had chapters in both books. And it was five chapters, not four. Two in Dance with Dragons, three in A Feast for Crows. So George was pretty close on that one. The tale didn't grow too much in the telling in this one. So the end of A Feast for Crows, she kills Darian. You might think that's her first gift, but I don't think so because that wasn't sanctioned. Remember Darian's the Night's Watch deserter? They didn't tell her to kill him. She just did that. She's like, I'm justice. I'm the Night Wolf. That's my brother you deserted from, you know? (laughs) So it doesn't seem to be the gift though it is a kill of sorts so it might sort of be what george had in mind she is in fact punished for doing this she's had her blindness she's been she's made blind now it looks like they were going to do that anyway they were going to blind her anyway because it's part of her training but they did it sooner because of this which arguably it's it's not a punishment it's a reward (laughs) never really thought about it this way it's like wait i was gonna have to learn this anyway so wait, you're, you're basically just skipped. A, you, you, this is like I skipped a grade. Like I'm starting the first grade earlier because I did this thing that you say is wrong, that it was against the rules. But I'm. it sounds like I'm in the advanced class because I'm such a good killer. <laughs> That's kind of what it sounds like. <laughs> like you punished me by giving me my lesson early. Like, I don't think that's I'm going to graduate sooner. Like, mm. anyway, her first actual gift, meaning on the orders of the faceless men on the under the auspices of the many face God, which is what they call it, right? Giving the gift. It's, it is in her final A Dance of Dragons chapter. So he pretty much did keep the idea of being at the end just one book later. Uh, and he, he, the note of the joy of giving is pretty dark. Like she's supposed to enjoy it or is taught to enjoy it. Not that she necessarily does. Our, uh, Nina reminds us the kindly man explains what he sees as the gift of death pretty early in the final version of Arya's A Feast for Crows arc before Arya has actually killed anyone uh, meaning before Darian and so, so well before she's tasked with an actual you know hit so yeah uh, she doesn't seem too joyful after her first gift but she does seem joyful after the kill in the mercy chapter she seems very joyous like she's 
she knows she's going to get punished for it. She knows she's screwed up. She knows that her masters will be unhappy, but she's, she steps lightly after finishing, after getting her revenge on, uh, crossing <laughs> him, uh, crossing, uh, Raph off of her list. So interesting, right? Uh, also interesting that the, that mercy at the gate is that final note that's crossed out because it's like George has written the mercy chapter so long ago. And he just keeps having to push it because of the, well, it, now I got to push it. Well, I got to push it again because of no five year gap and I got to keep pushing it. But uh, it's, it's clear how long he's had this plan. Remember to mercy at the gate, the gate is the name of the playhouse where the chapter takes place at. So that's extremely straightforward. So I think this is maybe not super revealing, but it is it is additional context to how George wants to bring along her her personality throughout this process, like what she likes and doesn't like, like what she takes to and what she doesn't take to about being a member of a death cult, you know, like what is that? How does that affect her? So I think that's really the the part he was weighing and still thinking through but he had a lot of the main places and aspects of the plot structurally if he was still figuring out her inner inner monologue and how it would affect her as a character i think that's the stuff that was constantly in development and probably still is but clearly he had a lot of these plot points in play way ahead of time unlike some of these other characters that were more organically grown in the garden. This is, this is architecture right here for the most part. Now, here's an example of a garden gone a little wild, a garden grown a little out of control, kind of the opposite of the architect's situation here where he didn't have, he, he maybe did a lot of things back and forth, wasn't sure, settled on some things, had some struggles, and that's Tyrion. Here's some notes. First, witness to incest. At first it was written, witness the incest. And through some discussions that included myself on the Reddit thread, it was determined that it was witness to incest. I quipped that witness the incest sounds like rejected Targaryen house words. Because, you know, when they were all, when Aegon was about to launch his conquest, remember they didn't have a banner or house words. They're like, well, what are we going to do for house words? Like, Eventually, they settled on fire and blood, right? But they probably had some other ideas first. And witness the incest. Seems like it would have fit for them. <laughs> but they set it on fire and blood instead. Yeah. Okay. The notes continue here. We have Prince of Sorrows, colon, eases psychic pain, question mark, question mark, comfort, question mark, prophecy, question mark, whorehouses, in quotes, whores go everywhere, in quotes, courage, not in quotes, let it go or it will become you, not in quotes. Let them go, dash, will not bring you peace. Also not in quotes. And pain will keep you what you have to do. So the, the, this is a note, the keep question mark. is It's not sure that that's what it says, but it makes sense. Like keep, pain will keep you from doing what you have to do. Something along those lines, I think. Then there's a separate set of notes, the page three notes. Remember page one and two and page three are separate instances of note taking on George's part. So page three says Tyrion, colon, cliffhanger with Danny question mark captured by sir jorah question mark one the sorrows two volantis three the sea four danny three the sea and four danny are crossed out the sorrows and volantis are not and then there's a five encircled to indicate the number of chapters now so again this is kind of why i placed this back to back with aria and sansa because the aria and sansa ones are are changed amongst the least and his plans have changed amongst the least. Whereas this Tyrion one is, is the opposite. The sparseness of the notes can cut both ways. In some cases, there's very little said because in maybe in Brienne's case, he's hadn't developed it yet. Or in Arya's or Sansa's case, it was developed well in advance and he did not see the need to change it. But in Tyrion, he went back and forth a lot. He, some of the sparseness indicates there's a lot he notated elsewhere or or just already had in mind or just didn't know what to do, was just struggling. I, I think that's that's where Nina seems to land is that he was struggling with Tyrion. And that does seem to, I, I find it hard to disagree with that take. And I get it too. Like it is, just the undertaking of the series in general is just a huge mind effort. 
Interesting that there's no mention of his time with Illyrio, right? There's no Illyrio time, no time on the road, no time on the Dragon Roads there, no time about nothing mentioned about Pentos, even though it seems pretty likely that's where he was headed all along. I mean, he got into a wine cask and Varus shipped him off. Like, it's pretty clear he was going to Illyrio. But Var the intent may have been just to kind of skip over the Illyrio time and not to give much time with him or just, or just make that be real brief and just head over to Griff real quickly and not much else. Uh, and I don't know if George had decided how Tyrion was going to get to all these different places. Like, how is he going to get on the sea? How is he going to get to Danny? How is he going to get through the sorrows? Like, who's going to be with at these times? Like, that's that's part of what he was struggling with. Obviously, he, he settled on the crew of the Shy Maid, um, mostly the leaders of the people protecting young Griff. But whether he's going to be with them first or after, whether Jorah's going to capture him and then he's going to go to them or whether he's going to be with them and then be captured by Sir Jorah, which is what happened, uh, how that's going to, what order of effects that's going to go into. There is the mention of the sea, which is crossed out, as I said. The sea and Danny are both crossed out, which indicates that he planned on having her, having him get to Volantis or maybe as far as getting all the way to Danny, uh, although it seems like he figured out that probably wasn't going to happen. But the plan was for a feast for crows, get half of the way there, and then by the end of dance, get to Danny, which even that didn't happen. But it's roughly how many chapters he planned out. See, it says five chapters here for maybe just these all four of those events, or maybe the five chapters for just for the Sorrows and Volantis, which is more how it settled, because I think there's 10 Tyrion chapters in A Dance with Dragons, and... Yeah, he still, of course, is, couldn't get to Danny by the end of that because Danny isn't even in Flavors Bay. <laughs> She's in <laughs> the Dothraki Sea. Uh, of course, on the sea is when he gets to Makoro and Penny and with Jorah. He's already been captured by Jorah. Then they get captured, and that leads to their enslavement. From here, it just says Danny, right? That's the next step is Danny. So he hasn't figured out how to get Tyrion from where he is now or from the sea where he left these notes to being in front of her from being on court with her being presented to her. He has basically escaped slavery and attached himself to the second sons and is now signing deals to get and becoming kind of his former personality, which is what he needs to be to be of use to Danny. He's not going to be helpful to her if he's just a sad, pathetic, you know, depressed guy who's drinking all the time. He needs to be a, wisecracking, clever political thinker to be of value and to be a more interesting character too. <laughs> uh, so we'd like to see that uh, as in terms of the story. That would be more interesting. And it does seem the, the way it's heading. He does seem to be coming out of it near the end of his arc from what we've seen so far. And it seems like Danny is a few steps away. We, I, I'm very curious to see how that's actually going to go, how he's going to present himself to her, how he's going to make himself useful, how he's going to argue that he's not, in fact, a Lannister like his uh, the rest of his family. Uh, yeah, lots of stuff like that, but the Prince of Sorrows, the, AKA his gray grace, AKA the shrouded Lord. This is a super interesting part of this because George wrote a whole chapter on the shrouded Lord. Tyrion meets the shrouded Lord. It's, it's finished apparently. And it's in the vault. We hopefully one day we'll see it. Maybe it'll be like a bonus release material thing someday far in the future. And, mm, he just couldn't make it work. He said it didn't fit. It didn't cover the basis he wanted to. He loved how he wrote it. He was very happy with the writing for it, but it just didn't fit the story. And the, this would have... The idea with the Prince of Shor Sorrows of the Shrouded Lord was to help Tyrion get back to who he is, get back to the thing I'm talking about, about becoming himself again, about getting rid of his conflict, about getting over... Uh, what happens with his father, getting over his history, realizing that it's going to drag him down if he doesn't uh, snap out of it or if he doesn't crawl out of it or find the strength to do what needs to be done. So let's look at how it actually played out in Dance with Dragons when they simply discuss the Shrouded Lord because they never do see him, of course, or her or it <laughs> without ever meeting them. The discussion starts with river pirates, one of whom gelds all her male captives where we pick up the quote
If we encounter this Lady Cora, I will just slip into a skirt and say that I am Cersei, the famous bearded beauty of King's Landing. This time, Duck laughed, and Howland said, What a droll little fellow you are, Yolo. They say that the Shrouded Lord will grant a boon to any man who can make him laugh. Perhaps his Grey Grace will choose you to ornament his stony court. I love that it's Lady Cora of all the episodes for Sean to not be on. Uh, as if, if, you, if you stick towards the end of the episode, you'll remember that Sean, one of his cats, is named Cora. Yes. Cora does not geld humans or cats that we know of. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> so this actually causes Tyrion to freeze up a bit, despite his downplaying of magic. Despite the way he sort of just, eh, ha, snarks and grumpkins when people talk about the others. Now, remember, he does kind of have a different view on things when he's staying on top of the wall. But other than that, he tends to just laugh at the idea of some of these things. But when the idea of grayscale comes up, which is not... A, a laughing matter or a matter of fantasy it's it's real in this world he just freezes up he was he didn't care about joking about gelding like having <laughs> his dick cut off didn't bother him all that much he's like haha that's funny but grayscale oh he freezes up and howden notices he's like don't you look so pale yalo i beg your pardon i was just joking you know but Tyr he's Tyrion's legit freaked out which is setting up what would have been the meeting with this actual being, right? It, that just never happened because George decided that chapter didn't work. But he feels it deeply. He tells himself it's just a legend, uh, but he can't shake it. How amazing would it have been if he had actually encountered this legend in reality? Uh, the, but even if the reality isn't as dangerous or as supernatural as we think, because it's, it's, it's almost certainly just a person using this identity like the Dread Pirate Roberts or Zorro or something like that, where there's lots of people that have worn this identity, uh, which builds on itself by being, well, this being has existed for hundreds of years, or they can't be killed, or what have you. The key feature of the Shrouded Lord is his so-called Grey Kiss, which gives grayscale. Now, this is just a legend, of course. The Shrouded Lord can't give people grayscale, I don't think. Uh, but it's tight wrapped up in the legend because one of the versions of the legend is that the shrouded lord is garen the great himself the fallen roinar prince who led his people to defeat against valyria only to create grayscale or inflict grayscale on a lot of his valyrian captors from his prison and so some people say that he is garen come again which would if so, that explains why he has all this power over Grayscale and has the Grey Kiss anyway. And of course, this is very symbolic for what actually happens is Tyrion doesn't have a direct encounter with the Shrouded Lord. Of course, he instead has a Grey Kiss metaphorically or, or almost directly by falling into the water, falling into the, the sorrows. And that's like a baptismal rebirth kind of thing. And it is, again, because Tyrion is being reborn even though he's being re reborn sort of into a former version of himself getting over all his his problems his his mental trauma his his guilt and the river he drowns in it's it's metaphorically associated with sorrow it's represented by tears so that's kind of neat that he falls into a river of the sorrows which is kind of describes his state of mind in, in a lot of ways so the river can be symbolically like a river of tears which, of course, the, the, it's called the Sorrows because of the weeping over the fate of the Roinar uh, that Garen himself was, was, was seeing, was forced to watch. So it seems that the Shrouded Lord was meant to be his turning point, point towards regaining his former identity. It, it says that in the notes. It says, let's review it. Prince of Sorrows, colon, eases psychic pain, question mark, comfort, prophecy. So eases psychic pain, prophecy, comfort, things that help him get over where he's at it seems like that's what's being described healing getting right again so it, it seems like george was struggling on how the shrouded lord would actually help accomplish this for Tyrion. how is the shrouded lord going to set Tyrion right or set him on that proper journey to get right and i think he just it just didn't work it was shrouded lord was not the right vehicle for that it was not the way to this mysterious dangerous deadly p pirate creature person is not the way to get to teach Tyrion courage or not the way to imbue 
a new lease on life. Not a way for him to think of, you know, who are they? He's thinking of, let it go or it will become you. Let them go will not bring you peace thinking about them. Who are they? Probably Taisha, Shay, people he's guilty over, maybe Tywin, maybe his whole family. Yeah. Uh, and the question, whores go everywhere, which is in quotes here, pretty clearly an answer to the question, where do whores go? Which is a, a big part of how Tyrion continuously expresses his sadness. I believe we referred to it as a, as a light motif before, something that a lot of the characters have. A phrase they repeat from time to time that helps establish their identity or where they are in life at that moment. Something that is on their mind a lot. So Tyrion says that a lot ever since leaving Westeros. A part of him desperately wants to reconnect with the only person who he ever really felt that happy with, Tysha, and maybe to a lesser extent, extent Shay. But he has bitterness towards Shay. He doesn't have bitterness towards Tysha. He has bitterness towards himself over Tysha. With Shay, he's kind of like a mix of guilt and betrayal. And with Tywin, it's the same thing. A mix of guilt and betrayal without the romantic angle, but instead of familial duty. Intellectually, he knows it would never work. Intellectually, he knows Taisha would probably hate him, but he can't help but thinking of the time when he was happy when he was younger and uh, freer of these burdens and of, of all these things that have happened in his life that have made it that have made it so negative at this point. So the missing link is Penny. There's no Penny in any of these notes. It might sound strange to say, but she's the Prince of Sorrows. Literally, meaning from a literal point of view, literature point of view. She's the mirror of his own existence. She is how he gets right. She's the window to him seeing his own privilege. He sees himself in her, but without the advantages of being a man, without the advantages of being in a, in a patriarchal world, without the advantages of, of his birth, which is an even bigger deal in this case. Uh, so he knows, like intellectually, he knows he probably would have been killed at birth by a lot of families. That's not entirely true, though. Even some noble families would do that, but a lot of people would not. They would... It's their kid. They're not going to kill their child. That's not so normal, actually, Tyrion. And I'm not blaming him for that. It's what he was taught. But he's unlearning some of the things that he's learned from growing up on a perch. A perch built by being a member of a great house. And so Penny teaches him more about who he is than the Shrouded Lord ever could. The Shrouded Lord is this supernatural-ish probably not actually supernatural, but sh shrouded <laughs> in supernatural mystery. And that's not what George decided was the right way for Tyrion's conflict to be resolved. Uh, he, Penny, a much more mundane thing, a much more mundane person, someone that's way more grounded. Rather than going an extreme, legendary, semi-supernatural, he's like, no, actually, the best route for this character to make this plot work is something simpler more honest right more straightforward more empathetic you can empathize with penny Tyrion starts to at first he doesn't but he starts to and he has dark thoughts about her too which surprise him and the reader and he's like whoa what am i doing why am i having these dark thoughts i gotta stop this it's one of the many things that tells him that he needs to change his ways and he needs to stop being a uh depressed alcoholic and get back to living get back to being the Tyrion that's a lot more entertaining so even though he struggled George did with how to make all this work how to connect all these dots how to make Tyrion get back on this path how to fit that into all these other swirling plot lines of young Griff and John Connington and Danny young Griff Danny none of that I mean young Griff and Connington none of that's mentioned here None of that at all. So it's always been kind of interesting to think about the Blackfire angle to all this. And like, well, yeah, good example of the gardening really paying off. George did not have to do anything with the Blackfire stuff. It was not overwhelmingly set up. It wasn't like, boom, all this is definitely going somewhere. No, it was just some cool pieces of history, some clues that added up to something. But if George had done nothing with it, it wouldn't have been, it would have been disappointing, but it wouldn't have been bad writing. It would have been like, oh, he set all this and doing, he didn't really set all that much up. He opened the possibility to it. He opened the door to it. There's still plenty of people who don't think that young Griff is even of Blackfire descent. And it doesn't necessarily matter. It just matters if he's 
Targaryen or not. It matters if he's Rhaegar's or not. It doesn't matter who he actually is. It just matters who, if he is who he says he is or isn't, right? There's three layers to that, whether he's Rhaegar's son or not, and then whether who he actually is, whether he's a Blackfire or not. And those are two separate things. So the sequence is actually pretty intact, minus the fact that George added a lot to it. Sorrows, Volantis, the sea, Danny. That all does happen in that order. And there's more to it, of course. Like we said, there's the Illyrio stuff prior to that. And in between the sea and Danny, there's quite a bit because Danny is no longer the final destination. Slaver's Bay still is, but she's not there. So there's got to be steps in between. And, uh, oh, actually, I said Tyrion had 10 chapters in A Dance of Dragons. He had 12. <laughs> John had 13, but he only beat Tyrion by three total minutes in terms of audiobook length because the Tyrion chapters are longer than the John chapters. So they're basically equal. And George had written in his notes five chapters for this. So no, no, 12, in fact. <laughs> so he was very off on that, which is part of our evidence for him really struggling to figure this out for a while. And another part that he, kept, he clearly kept is the question captured by Sir Jorah. Yes, in fact, yeah, that is exactly what happened, and it ends up happening in his sixth chapter. So pretty much halfway through the 12. So yeah, that's pretty perfect. And it shows that he had the idea for quite a while. Like Sir Jorah capturing Tyrion, he's a, he at least had that idea back in 2003. In the book, The Dance of Dragons was written in 2011, or finished in 2011. He might still give us this cliffhanger that's listed here. It says cliffhanger, question mark, end with, da uh, end with Danny, or cliffhanger with Danny. That could still happen. It just obviously didn't happen in Dance of Dragons. It could happen in The Winds of Winter, which would make it less of a cliffhanger. It, it, it could have a chapter end on that, but, you know, there'll be a chapter five, eight POVs later that, that we'll get resolution on. So it won't be like a book cliffhanger. It'll be a chapter cliffhanger, which is fine. But it, how's it going to be resolved? Like, it's going to be put in front of Danny. I've been waiting for this forever and been thinking about it forever. Like, could it be the Brown Ben Plum thing where the dragons like him or could it be uh he just rattles off a lot of things that he knows that he talks danny into it which he's really good at he's talked a lot of people into things right whether it's the mountain clans whether it's uh varis or or braun or duck halden just lots of different people uh, he's good at it he's one of his most recurring uh, features is his ability to change people's mind, his ability, ability to win people over despite everything. And yeah, so I think we're still going to get the cliffhanger with Danny, just clearly not as soon as George originally intended. Uh, and this could also be where the first notation comes in. This one has really thrown us. I have no idea what this means. It's the note witness to incest. That was the first note in here. It's written by itself. It's not attached to any other notes. Nina as well probably thought about it as much as any of the other notes. Uh, we, we talked about it all throughout this last, this last week and, and, and more than that. But especially this week, we're just like, I still have no idea what that means. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> There's a couple of messages back and forth of, what is this going on here? Okay, so this is, as best, this is the best ideas that we have. And you'll see why they're just okay ideas. Okay, so maybe just, it's the simplest thing is that he sees... He knows that Tommen and Marcella are bastards because he's a witness to Jamie and Cersei's incest. He's not literally a, wit a, wit a witness. He didn't see them. But he knows. She basically admitted it to him, you know. Uh, but there's a lot of people who are witness to that. A lot of people can vouch for that, right? Like, even maybe even Barristan, who's already in Danny's group. But maybe that wasn't something George thought of here. But Barristan was part of Danny's group well before that. He's been a part of her group since the Storm of Swords. So... I don't know if that's it. And I don't even know if that's that important. Like, does he, does he really need to be a witness to their incest for that to matter? Like they're going to fight regardless. It's not like witnessing the incest is like, who's going to believe it, right? Like no one's going to believe Tyrion anyway. He's already could by most Westerosi's in most Westerosi people's minds. Tyrion is an unreliable person. His word is not going to be good enough, even though he's their brother to, for people to believe for sure that Tommen is a product of incest and Macella. So is that really that valuable to Danny to have that for someone that can verify that? Cause it's just, he said, he said, she said, uh, another possibility is again, returning to the TV show. <laughs> Tyrion literally witnesses their incest on the TV show, the boat sex moment, right? 
<laughs> I mean, he doesn't see them. He sees her. He sees John go into her room late at night. He doesn't actually watch them in bed. But that's as close as we get to it. But what does that matter? Who? What does that even matter? You know, <laughs> that was he sees them in the show. The show did very little with that, because which would be an indication of the show misinterpreting George's intent. Like witnessed incest. Well, he sees them doing it. Is that what and George the timing, said? honestly, for that is yeah, just so, so much off. Later. Yeah, yeah. For, yeah, it seems off, but that is where my mind went too. But it just doesn't seem to work. It does not seem to work. Yeah. So this you can see why we're like, I have no idea what these notes mean. Witness to incest. Yeah. So what other incest could there be? I don't know who else there is. Like what other incest is there, you know, in the story? I can't think of any. <laughs> I don't, don't. I guess my other question is, is there, was this written after Tyrion had left uh, King's Landing? Yeah, he leaves King's Landing at the end of A Storm of Swords. Well, I mean, was this outline written before that happened? Like, was that written after... The notes are from 2003, but we don't know when they were actually written. Okay. It's possible they they come from before that, but probably not. Okay, that was all. They're probably after Storm of Swords, yeah. So let's look at let's look back on all these as a whole. We've gone through the individual POV, so I've got some sort of thoughts on them as a group, looking at parallels and and themes and and patterns. Lots of them describe endings: John, Tyrion, Danny, Sansa, but very few of them actually end the way that he planned. The, Sansa one kind of does or will. The Tyrion one might still get to that point, but it's going to be in a different place. The John one was pretty close because the hard home thing is only one chapter different. And yeah, so the rest we'll, we'll have to see. Lots of characters with multiple identities. We talk about how that was a, a bit of a tricky thing for knowing which character we're dealing with. Uh, meaning, for example, the Hound? Was that Rorge? Lem? Or Sandor? Or maybe even someone else? He might have considered giving the helm to somebody else besides one of those characters? Was Arya Jane Poole or actual Arya? Was Rattleshirt Mance or actual Rattleshirt? And despite that, there's no mention of Young Griff in here, which is a character whose identity we're wondering about as well. Now... A note on that, it's a good example of, well, just because there's not in the notes here doesn't mean George didn't have plans for that, but he might not have. Yeah, I mean, the the whole John Connington drinking himself to death over, overseas, it's pretty easy to undo because that's just a rumor. That's just something that people said. Uh, but it may be that George had that idea a long time ago, didn't really strongly consider using it, but then realized, hey, actually, I'm going to have to make use of that particular plant that I grew back then. <laughs> Because I need more more bulk here, more to do for Tyrion's story. And it fits into the history really well. He slid that in so well. It's, it's a great insertion of that plot line. But it does kind of indicate that maybe it wasn't part of the original plan. On the other hand, we've been saying a long time that the plan for a young Griff or an a, a, a alternate Aegon has been in place for since the beginning. Because who, who else is Arya, who else is Illyrio and Varys talking about? When they're when Arya overhears them in a Game of Thrones down in the basement there with the dragon skulls, who are they talking about? Who are they talking about putting on the throne? If not Young Griff, there's no other candidate. John, John's at the wall. They they have no indication of, of it's John. They have no there's no indication they know who he is that they can restore him to the throne that way. It doesn't it doesn't really work. And it can't be Viserys because from the very beginning, Illyrio is smirking at Viserys and there's no way they look at this guy like a serious candidate. They they clearly see him as a patsy and they clearly don't see it as Danny because they sold her to Khal Drogo and didn't expect her to didn't expect her to live. <laughs> so it really means that this part was there all along. It just means that maybe George didn't have Tyrion wrapped up in it in first that part was cha was added later the whole Tyrion getting into that group and, and being part of their their gang for a little while because if you think about it the way he gets included in them is through Illyrio but the way he gets separated from them is one of the more random events of all of A Song of Ice and Fire he goes to a a random brothel in Voluntharis <laughs> and Jorah's there that's one of the most random things that ever happens in all of A Song of Ice and Fire. Like, talk about coincidence. So, there's really no way to not make that a coincidence. <laughs> but it is kind of like, 
I wouldn't call that cheating, but it's like, it's, it's very random. Like that's awfully convenient for the plot to have that there. It's again, not complaining, but if, if, if an author were to do that a lot, it would be bad, but doing it once or twice, no big deal. It's fine. Weirder things do happen in real life. After all, look at the way World War One started. That's far more random than this. <laughs> and if you don't know what I'm talking about, one of the assassins that was trying to kill Archduke Franz Ferdinand failed to shoot him during the parade, went to a cafe to have a sandwich, was sitting, eating his sandwich on the balcony. He looks down. He's like, wait a minute. That's the Archduke in his open car without a, without a roof, just right there. They had accidentally turned down that street. The driver went the wrong way. And he's like, oh, let me turn around and go back. And the guy's like, the murderer, the assassin's like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> so he just shoots him right there. And World War One breaks out. I mean, that's when you have real things like that in this in, on Earth. Jorah meeting Tyrion at a random brothel and voluntaries. I can buy that. <laughs> but not too many times. Not too many times. So let's I, I talked about the characters who have end with. But let's talk about the actual points on end with end with hard home End with her first gift End with hound fight. End with blood and fire. End with cliffhanger with Danny. End with I'm going home. So again, that's one of the things George is, uh, has in mind for a lot of these characters. He has a, a not an ending. This isn't the end of their character. It's the end of their arc in this book. But as you can see here, a lot of those were changed. Hard home, obviously that was slightly changed. Her first gift, pretty similar. Hound fight, similar, but hard to understand if that's what George had in mind originally because of the the variance within the name hound. Blood and Fire was Dorn. That did end that way with Dorn Martell holding the dragon piece, the, the side vast dragon piece. Cliffhanger with Danny. That's yet to come. So that's probably still is going to happen. And then I'm going home. Yeah, Danny's going to say that at some point, probably, or something to that effect. It hasn't happened yet either, but I, I, I'd be surprised if it doesn't. Uh, Dorn, of course, sounds like he wasn't sure who the POVs would be yet. Uh, he might have tried to make it one POV and then he might have wrestled with that for a while until just giving up and being like, nah, there's no way I can make it just be one POV, which is similar to how the prologue chapter went where he tried a bunch of different things and did what he did. Uh, no mention of the Ironborn chapters in this entire run, but the arms of the Kraken was already written and the arms of the Kraken, if y'all forget was he released four Ironborn chapters in 2003. So the same year of, of these notes, I believe. In a magazine called Dragon, Dragon Magazine. Um, I, I have a copy of it. And it, the chapters are almost identical to their final form. They're very, like, like a slight sentence structure change in one or two places. Nothing that's fundamentally different. So it's the four chapters that are Ironborn in A Feast for Crows are represent the Arms of the Kraken plus one. There's one more chapter in the book that isn't in Arms of the Kraken. And that's because it's the Reaver chapter because it's a climax. That's like when Euron tells him you got to go to slaver's bay for me when he tries to convince the ironborn to go there and they laugh at him but he you know they're like no we want to go to the arbor that's the climactic moment in a feast for crows for the ironborn plot so he didn't include that in the <laughs> in the giveaway that came three years before the book was published so that's understandable but that's why he's not they're not talked about here is because he f had it all figured out he did it already it was already written and he didn't really have to change it now of course i mean the new ironborn chapters i mean asha Aaron and Victorian. Obviously, I'm not talking about Theon because Theon's a whole different thing. Yes, he's technically Ironborn, but his story is so separate from all that. Um, and there, there is, you know, there's a funny, like, awkward mention of a trip to the Dreadfort in one of the Amazon releases, which looks like the weird plot that the TV show did with Asha going all the way around to try to rescue Theon from the Dreadfort which would have been a weird thing to have in the books, <laughs> but was in the show. So <laughs> yeah, uh, there's also no mention of John Connington. There's no mention of Barristan. There's no mention of Quentin. There's no mention of Melisandre. There is mention of Kevin. And there's no mention of Bran. That's the most interesting omission from all of these. Cause I can understand all the other ones have pretty obvious explanations. Melisandre was added later. Quentin was definitely added later. Barristan was added later. John Connington was probably added later as a part of the Tyrion. He's in, you know, part of the Tyrion development. And of course, we also mentioned the Blackfish and Stoneheart separately. But yeah, Bran, not in there at all. Either George was working on that separately or he'd already decided or 
uh, he, he what he may have decided was that you know just even though there's no five year gap, he's still going to have to have some time pass for Bran. It's still going to be off page for a while, which is again. TV show, no Bran in season four or five, was it? I forget which one. One of those two seasons he wasn't in. So that kind of fits with this whole idea, which is a pivot to our final bit here. The TV show notes kind of wrapping that up. If you look at these notes without context, they're almost exactly what did happen on Game of Thrones. Danny claiming she's going home after Marine. The Loosed Dragons. It's a huge climactic moment in the show with a big sea battle. And in the in the books, we barely see them. Quentin lets them out. He gets killed like immediately or nearly killed. Well, he's burned badly and then he dies later. But his chapter ends almost immediately after that. And then we just find out from Barristan later that the, the dragons are just a couple. They're just taking over some of the pyramids. They're just hanging out there. And then we actually get a good look at them in the chapters before the battles in the Winds of Winter uh, through Tyrion and Barristan's eyes. And, of course, Danny is long gone by that point. John does go to Hardhome in the show, as we, as we know. It's a very famous episode. Brienne actually fights Sandor Clegane in the show, the Hound. Instead of removing the context, you fight the Hound, Sandor Clegane, rather than someone wearing the Hound's helm. A lot of the Mercy chapter is actually in the show. A lot of those details. And we do know for sure that D&D were some of the first to read that chapter. Because uh, the chapter was written so far in advance. And of course, as I said during the Tyrion section, witness to incest. In the show, they saw it directly. So <laughs> amazing. Like these notes, context free, the show did them. <laughs> it's like they just, yeah, let's do that. Let's do it. It's like without a lot of thought, it seems like in some cases, just the bare bones of, well, this happened. So let's put it in the show, you know? So yeah, not, not great. Um, <laughs> you can kind of almost see where they got some of that and uh, screwed it up. If you enjoyed this episode, let us know, not just because we like hearing from you, but because there's there this is a different kind of episode, it's a different style, and we want to know when we do something different, it's it's more even more important for us to know what you thought of it. Like if we wanted if you wanted to do another episode of this type, like if we do the 1993 outline as an episode or some Cushing Library archives, we could do some of that maybe. Let us know. Mm, we are all about the feedback. We have so many different ways we can approach the material that we like to hear from you in order to help factor that in when making decisions on how to present it from our side. Here's a question from Twiss. I like how George's outline style relies on some kind of simple quirky line that in his head equals that character's chapter or arc. Yeah, it's like it's a mnemonic device, like a something that like a one song lyric Reminds you the entire song. Like you hear the one line from the chorus and it just, you can hear the whole song in your head or at least large parts of it. It only takes a little bit to bring you to the whole thing. And uh, George's memory seems to work like that. Like all he needs is one little tidbit, one little, like one little hum that remem reminds him of the entire tune. And it seems to be how his brain works. It's why he gardens because gardening works for him. If he was just someone that was constantly forgetting things, you would think he would write more things down. And, but, you know, maybe he, maybe he does. <laughs> I just don't know, <laughs> but it doesn't seem to be a big deal because he remembers so much. And what does get written is so great that, mm, who am I to complain? I'm not. I'll just wait until we get more. All right, folks, the trivia question uh, was, who is his gray grace? The answer is the shrouded Lord that was mentioned by Halden here in the quote, so hopefully you were paying attention and got that, or maybe you just remembered because you uh, recalled it from reading the book in the first place. Good job to Scott Wartman, who guessed it correctly at nice the beginning job, of Scott. the episode. Yeah, Bloody Scott Blackwood. Good job. And anyone else, if you got it, you listening to this later, good on you. We'll be back next time with more. In the meantime, I want to offer some thanks to uh, our patrons. Those of you subscribe to us either through Patreon or through Spotify, you get lots of uh, benefits from signing up and the knowledge that you're supporting one of your favorite shows. Thanks to Nina for her insight and great notes. This was a particularly difficult episode to think about because it's a, it's a different sort of thing. We're not just unpacking things from within the world. We're unpacking things from the writer's process, which is a lot more complicated and something we don't know as much about. Like we're not professional writers i have spent a huge chunk of my life deciphering a song of ice and fire but not 
you know, from in, mostly from an in-world perspective, you know. Uh, so that's that. Thanks to Joey, Jesse, Bran, and Michael for various uh, assistance with our music and video. Bran, we're very excited to be able to debut a new uh, version of our House of the Dragon intro for House of the Dragon season, which is going to feature some string playing by my very own mother. She's a violist, and they did some recording just a few days ago. That's going to be really cool. So it's gonna, the sound is going to be even fatter. That, that's a good thing. P-H-A-T fatter. Yeah. Michael Clarfeld, thanks to you as well, my friend, for your maps and video intro. And uh, also wanted to sh- mention a couple episodes that came up in this one that you might want to check out for further listening. Valar Reedus for A Feast for Crows and A Dance with Dragons is where a lot of our deep cut material on some of this happens, including some things that relate directly to these roads not traveled or these uncertainties. Also, I recommend our Blackfish episode because it talks about a lot of the possibilities with Stoneheart and where some of the BWB stuff is going and some of that possibilities, as well as our episodes on Euron and the uh, Winds of Winter uh, audio play chapters. We've got uh, a few of those. We've got one for Victorian 1, T-Wow. We've got one for Tyrion 2, T-Wow. And we've got one for the Mercy chapter. All those chapters came up today in discussion. So you want to hear members of the fandom doing voices for the characters, reading the chapter and having music and sound effects. Yep, that's on our feed. Uh, If you haven't listened to those, well, why not today? And until next time, we'll be back with more. Happy New Year and happy holidays, everybody. Our next episode will be recorded in 2024, where uh, we hope to have another great year of lots of content, lots of existing in the world of Westeros, Essos and beyond. And until then... Valar, reread us.